Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here to another illustrious meeting of our college. Uh, there are two rules at the college. One is no one fool at a time, and the other is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak up to about an hour. Then we'll have our question and answer period. And then after that, we will have our uh, rebuttal period. We generally finish about nine, but since we're on Zoom and not in a restaurant yet, we can extend it a little bit more if we need to. Otherwise, uh, you know, we can get started going. I'm sorry, we can keep moving here. Tonight's speaker will be, Ann, uh, will be Anna Shufflebein, and she'll be talking about uh, ballot initiatives. And uh, Charlie, let's get started with the announcements. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number... 3,653 of the college complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, first of all, again, we have a email group, a Google email group, which you are invited to join for one or two announcements of upcoming programs, as well as a meetup group, which functions much in the same fashion. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Um, next week on February the 19th, uh, Stanfield Smith uh, will giving us an update on the US war on Venezuela, uh, uh, socialist uh, policies there in effect over the years. On February the 26th, we're gonna be looking at uh, the future of high-tech driving, self-driving cars. Is this feasible or not? Uh, which has been discussed over the years. On March the 5th, Dan Weinberg will be discussing topics of the necessity of uh, ensuring uh, food and water uh, supplies for everyone. That's on March the 5th. Um, March the 12th, Chris Stanfield Smith will be returning, and we're going to look at the U.S. war, this time on Nicaragua, Los Sandinistas, El Camino Luminoso. Um, on March the 19th, uh, we're going to have an, an author, Dean Knight. Uh, he's written his memoirs uh, of adventures he's had. Um, as well as he's composed a manifesto, which should be interesting reading. On March the 26th, uh, Jian Lee from our other campus will be discussing how there is a yin-yang dynamism oper operating in the world. Moving into April, the Libertarian Party will be returning their candidate for the U.S. office, the uh, Illinois Attorney General's office, will be here. He's working on his presentation today. He's contacted me. On April, now we begin uh, our Earth Month series of speakers. Four speakers. Hey, you can't beat that. That's a good deal now. Four eco speakers. Okay. On April the 9th, one Earth Collective, Chicago based organization. Never been to the college before. Should be interesting. On April the 16th, we'll take a look at hydrogen <laughs> as an alt to clean energy uh, instead of stuff like thorium reactors, nukes. You don't want nukes, man. Um, <laughs> on April the 23rd, the Illinois Green Party will be returning. This time, their candidates for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Tell us why you should vote green. I'm going to, and so should you. Sure. On April the 30th, uh, where the topic will be forest, uh, replenishing your forest across the nation, and proof of, of the reason it is, is the proof of the existence of a primitive species uh, residing within um, the forest of the United States. Running into May, uh, on May the 14th, we're going to have the Truth Brigade. 
This is a section of the indivisible Illinois, but they, they want everyone to tell the truth. And they've got a method for arriving at it. On the 21st, I just booked, we're going to have someone who says that Trump was not a fascist and he didn't try a coup and didn't do anything wrong. So on May the 21st. Now we have May 7th is open. That's May Day speaker. We're looking for somebody to discuss organized labor or, or socialism. Uh, and the other date is uh, May 28th is open. And we also have four dates in May. Uh, also, we have a new feature uh, which we post uh, videos, free videos that are available for viewing online, uh, such as YouTube. Uh, so if you want to send me a video, I'll gladly post it you that you recommend other, other participants, students at the college might enjoy watching. It says free films online. There you go. Hey, look at that. Wow. There's some really good ones there. There's one on witchcraft and stuff like that. Okay, send me your links and uh, a little description of the program. That's it, Tim. Thank you very much, sir. Take it away. Anybody else who wants to make an announcement at this time for the good of the community? <laughs> okay, if not, Anna, you, the stage is yours and uh, go ahead and start speaking. I okay, great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Anna Schiepelbein. I'm an organizer with the Illinois Green Party. And today I'd like to talk to you about a strategy that we are, are doing um, this April and actually we'll walk through it. Uh, I just shared my screen so everybody should be able to go ahead and see the words to get your issues on the ballot with township citizen initiatives. So what I'm gonna be talking to you today is about the annual township meeting um, that's in Illinois. So every second Tuesday of the year, we can, the citizens can set up, um, we'll go through the process, but what we can do is actually try to get a question on the ballot without having, without having to go through too much red tape. And so what we're, what I'm going to be talking about is um, how we're going to do that. What, how, how, how to do that and why we're, why we're doing it. So for here, so for the annual township meeting, and this is just applies to um, the township. So it doesn't include the city of Chicago, unfortunately, but we have a secondary strategy that we're gonna be doing, talking about with that. But for the township strategy, so that's every jurisdiction outside of the city of Chicago. So that does include the outliers for Cook County that are not in Chicago. Um, so we'll, uh, most of you know, we have townships. We have, these are our first um, political uh, footholds that we have in our government. Most of the townships do services, highway services, um, elderly services, food services, um, and they are, they are their own taxing body. Um, so what we can do though is we can go to our townships the second Tuesday um, of April and have and be able to talk about having these questions on our ballot. So I'm going to take it down to what we are doing now. Now is the time where we can get our petition on the ballot and we can ha we have to hand it in to the township um, clerk's office no later than March 1st. But let's yeah. first talk about these petitions. I'm gonna kill my... What we like to do in the Illinois Green Party is that we like to have grassroots oh. democracy. But we like for the townships to come up with their own questions. Um, but we do have some questions provided to us uh, that, that are available. Um, I'm gonna skip down here. So we have we have some sample township petitions on our website and that's at ilgp.org slash April, 2022. So that's ilgp.org slash April, 2022. So 
when we go to the website and we click on sample annual township meetings, we see one of the first petitions. Um, so we need to have 15 registered township uh, registered voters per township, and there's thousands of townships in Illinois. So it's up to the up to the townships to go ahead, up to the people in the townships to go ahead, craft their own question, pick out one of these sample questions. So I'm, I love the Illinois Green Party because we are so involved with having the gra grassroots democracy. What do the people want? And it's our and we love to be able to be a guide to help facilitate that. So here we have a, a petition. Um, and this particular sample question is, should the state of Illinois, their agencies and political subdivisions set up a zero to negative carbon emissions priority date of January 1st, 2030 to address climate action now and set the same priority date in commercial regulation? So what we can do is have 15 registered voters per township sign this petition. We do recommend up to 30, but no less than 15. Bring that into your township clerk by no later than March 1st. And after that, you just have to follow up with the township clerk. Make sure we have our people come out to vote April 12th of 2022 and be able to have this question on that township ballot November 8th of 2022. I find this incredibly powerful and incredibly um, um, uh, empowering that we can be leaders. We can get this petition on the ballot. Um, so let's go back to the website. And I wanna start, I wanna talk about some of the dates. So, March 1st is coming up pretty quick. And we have a few townships in Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, some in Central Illinois. So we have some boots on the ground who are getting their questions in. If they have already not gotten them in, we've been able to collaborate with various coalition groups, um, including DFA um, and some other groups and be able to really move forward with this agenda of trying to have climate action, and not just in 2045, not just putting it on the back burner and talking about it later, but now. Everybody talks about the future. Well, we need to talk about the present and we need to talk about it now. We cannot wait any longer. It's too late for gradual policy. So, Let's say you get it, your letter in, your letter with your up to 30 not registered voters on the petition. They do not need to be notarized. Just get it into your township clerk. Uh, follow up with your township clerk. Make sure when you hand it in, you get a timestamp from them and a receipt that it's on there. And then after you have that done, you want to make sure that you have the supporters um, to come out on April 12th. And those who come out in opposition, there probably will be, but then we can try to work with them and explain why climate action is so important, why clean air is so important, why clean water is so important. These are not just some partisan issues. These are issues that affect us all. This is our world. This is our government. This is our water. This is our air that we're breathing. We need to make sure that it's good quality, that not only good for us, but good for generations to come. So what I'm gonna show you is a sample of a cover letter that we have. And this is one that would go in with the township clerk with, with, with the petitions. So you have the question on there again, that's just a sample. And then it, after you get it into the clerk's office, then you can start talking about getting the flyers out to, to people and getting that support for climate action now. There are lots of people who do believe that we need to do something immediately. Um, there are still some people who, who 
want to do something, but don't know how to start, don't know where, where to go. And so we're also providing them that boots on the ground, that grassroots democracy, and something that they can do. And if they can't do it this year, then annual township meeting means it's every year. So let's start going for next year. So that is pretty much for the township ballot. There is uh, more presentations. Uh, there is another presentation down here that was given at the fall conference uh, for the Illinois Green Party uh, in 2021. And there is another slide on here that I'd briefly like to talk about. And that's the Illinois Township meeting. And this is different and separate from the annual township meeting. So the Illinois Special Township meeting um, also has registered township voters. Um, so they would, you also have the same voting rights as the annual township meeting. So at, at the annual, well, at, here for the special township meeting, there's not just April 12th. It's not just the second Tuesday of, of, of April. This one, you hand in your letter and then you get to call for a special meeting um, so many days after. So this is also an additional option that the citizens of Illinois has to help drive these issues um, and force our elected officials to do something about it. Um, and with the annual township meeting, we can get that question on the ballot. So you get that question into your, to your clerk's office, follow up with them to make sure it's on the agenda. Um, there are some townships that do know about this. Um, there's uh, Berwyn Township, Naperville Township, uh, Peoria knows about it. Um, it has been used before, the, the Illinois Green Party has used this before um, in the past. So it's not anything um, that they shouldn't know about. There's very, they should be able to know about, the township should be able to know about that or be directed to one of the townships that do know about it. Um, so you get that petition into the clerk's office, follow up with them, start getting out your flyers for the support. So April 12th, you can only vote on April 12th if you have done your homework prior to no later than March 1st and got your, re your registered voters uh, letter in. So you, there's a whole process to it still. You can't just show up and vote. It needs to be on the agenda. Um, and that's how you get it on the agenda. So on April 12th, you can have your township meeting and you can go there and you can vote to have this on your, uh, it will actually be on the general um, election ballot just for your township. But, and it's a non-binding uh, uh, ballot question as well, but it will signify whether or not this is a issue that people care about. And there are lots of people who care about clean water and clean air, but too busy in their life, too disconnected from politics, don't know where to start. This helps them. If you have the average voter who doesn't know too much about uh, politics, but wants these basic things for their children, for themselves, for their grandbabies, for the future of our planet. And this is a great way for us to show the numbers and show that the if the people vote a lot to want these things, to want zero carbon emissions by 2030, then we will see that in the numbers. Um, so that is with the annual township meeting and very briefly about this Illinois special township meeting. Um, so a lot of it is it's 15 to 30 signatures. It's not a lot, but the big thing is getting the people out on April 12th. Um, so that is of the townships, then that's all the, all the townships that, and they're outside of Chicago. Now for Chicago, since you can't, cannot have a township meeting there and getting an, a, a question on the ballot requires a lot of resources um, that 
we we cannot do while we have uh, while we're in petition mode for our other established party status in the Metropolitan Water District. Um, we chose to go with the first available date for the Chicago uh, City Council um, that was close to April 12th. And that's the April 13th regular uh, Wednesday and 10 a.m. regular City Council meeting that they hold. Uh, we are still um, looking for one alder person to help present this uh, petition on the ballot, uh, but we are um, plan we are working with some groups. Um, we're bringing on some more groups um, to to be um, working towards this petition and pressing that 2030 date. And it's very important for us to not just put out 2045 or some other big date in the in the not near future we need something in the near future to to really really turn the ship around um so april 13th um 10 a.m chicago city hall is where we're planning on presenting a similar quite a similar question to the city hall um uh so that is on this website as well, we have the Chicago City Council meeting petition, and then there's another flyer on there. So here's the petition um, that we have. Um, so it has still, still the same kind of the, the similar uh, question that we have that the city of Chicago and their agency shall set a zero to negative carbon emissions priority day of January 1st, 2030 to address climate action now. Um, I know this is a really short, <laughs> a short presentation. I know that we're used to having a longer presentation, um, but this is this, this is my uh, the basics of the township ballot strategy and the Chicago petition as well. So that actually concludes my presentation. Okay, I think we might uh, be able to let her take questions at this point. Um, I'm going to take your screen down if you don't mind. Yeah, no, you got it. Or, okay. Yeah, I got it. I, I, I'm all set. So let's thank our speaker tonight. And I think you're going to be getting a lot more questions besides the thing. I got one for you. We had a township road commissioner who never had any uh, interest in politics. And he came in and, you know, he was the first guy that uh, I'll get you to you next, Janice. OK, with the next question, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll wait on mine. Uh, Janice, go ahead. Janice, go ahead with your question on mute. Oh, you're still on mute, Janice. You're still on mute, but there you go. OK. All right. Uh, yeah, um, my uh, well, I, actually, I was just noting about the petition for zero to negative carbon emissions, and those, you know, these this issue would take money, and it, uh, just putting in a petition would. Uh, could it be effective at all if there's no money associated with it? Well, there could be money. We have um, the financial transaction tax is once again in the legislature. Um, that's more commonly known as the LaSalle Street tax. And that's the $12 billion that the Illinois can earn in revenue uh, through the, the, the uh, Chicago trading market. And it's a very small sales tax. And there is no current sales tax on, on what is uh, being what the plan is to be taxed. Um, so that's the sales street tax is in it $12 billion. Um, the retailers loophole, I believe is now a done deal. And so that's gonna earn extra revenue for us. Um, but the Peoples and Planet First budget, they have uh, the plan for $23.5 billion um, that could be earned in Illinois. and. Most of that is that LaSalle Street tax. So we can earn revenue. We we can uh, we need to do things differently in, in Illinois. We need to stop the bleeding pensions. We need to stop the unfunded uh, pension plan, just 
stop it, <laughs> start a fund and pl pension plan and get this ship turned around. Um, so there is plenty, there, there is ways that we, what we can do to earn revenue, to invest in our future, whether or not our legislators will do that is a whole nother thing. I have a question. Uh, uh, this is Ellen. Yeah, Gordon. right. They don't do much of anything, do they? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you recall, I tried to run for the Green I Party. I did. I did. Unfortunately, the group picked Tom Wildon instead. Right. Yeah. Because I it was, was interested in it. You, did it a, you, know, you, you were up there and, you know, we welcomed uh, you to run, come, come again or run for a different office. Right. Did they did they elect him? I don't think so. That was for the Quigley position, right? And I, I it really did kind of go the wrong way for me. But uh, I, you know, regarding your talk tonight, I guess I maybe the reason I ran is I think we need to deal with this at the national, federal, EPA level. And I, you know, I study market research, and to me, it's like got to be a top-down supply side, do the right thing, you know, fund the EPA, re-regulate everything. And it almost seems like I, I've been involved with this war, world beyond war. And there, I mean, to me, to deal with the city council and the water reclamation and the township, I mean, it's like we're trying to build this thing on a little blade of grass. I, don't, I mean, I, I understand the, the concept of grassroots, but, uh, I, I mean, it, it's just, it's not going to work, right? If you've got the whole, you know, capitalist system pushing on you, <laughs> you well, know, so we just have to get the crooks out of the thing. To me, address it criminally. They poison our water. They, they poison our vaccines, you know, whatever. I mean, these things are so big. And I, I, it's like, I feel like young people are just you know, it's like we've been infiltrated and you got like teenagers, I don't, you know, trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel when basically the Republicans defunded it back in, you know, it's been a dirty trick that's been emerging for a long time. The neo-fascist takeover, invisible empire is in charge. You just have to challenge them, right? But, but legislation, is that going to work? I mean, you know, especially a township. I mean, you know, right? One city council person, why not start at the federal level? Well, we are all leaders and we are fighting this on all levels. It is not just, just the federal and let them take care of it. It's not just the, the township, let them take care of it. We need everybody on board. We need all hands on deck. Do you, um, do you are you in coalition with like the Democratic Party, the Republican Party? You know, do you try to build this coalition at the at the biggest, you know, of all of everybody? You know, well, we are willing to work with people who are willing to work with us. What about the EPA? I mean, if you're just it seems like you're focused a lot on the environment and the, um, you know, right. Does the EPA I mean, legally like restoring maybe laws that used to be there. Uh, I, I guess, I don't know, this question strategy, it just as a you know, market research strategy, it seems kind of small. <laughs> it, my, it, it is on a township level. So it is- Why yeah. townships? Why not? But when you do it statewide mm -hmm. and you have people in the Northern part talking the same as the ones that are in the Southern part and in the Central part, the city of Chicago is the biggest. And the city of, of Chicago, people, Chicago, right? The, the city of Chicago is like, is really the big kahuna that you have to try to just break through any awareness or any, I mean, well, like, you know how difficult it is just to get on the ballot. Why not sponsor a whole bunch of people in the Green Party, um, you know, people, everybody, and, and then they'll get in there and really push it, you know, I, I think it's got to be pushed or there'll be no awareness of what you're talking about. Uh, but the township, I mean, it doesn't even, have, what percent of the people live in Chicago versus the state? What, do you know? Or I don't know offhand. I'm sure we can get that Google. <laughs> right, okay. Anyhow, maybe there's other questions. So well, that's ahead. the next question. Yeah, I do. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, Anna, can I, if I lived in a rough this uh, township where there's a nuclear reactor like Batavia, could I run a, uh, a referendum to shut it down and to have no further presence of nukes in my township? Sure. Well, that's going to be a double-sided sword, but a good double-sided sword with a big silver lining. We can focus on community-based economics. We can focus on being able to help uh, the small businesses in that area, the, in the mom and pop shops, and uh, the people who are, do the brokerage businesses or do the locally made products. We can help them uh, be able to um, foster um, good, economic, good community economics. Um, so we definitely have ways to build a good economy, um, but, but the benefit of what they're getting is the health benefits. They're getting the health benefits of turning the ship around, of ha not having that land anymore keep on um, producing radioactive waste. And yeah. <laughs> you don't want that in your town. What exactly does a township government do? Mm -hmm. Um, they do a lot of services. Um, they do the highway. They do some of the highway uh, uh, services. They do elderly services. Um, mine has a community garden. Um, one of the, uh, there's Lake County that also has like a halfway house for women. So they help provide uh, the ser community services. Well, what I was going to say before is I live in Algonquin Township, and we had a big, uh, there was a guy who was there for 30 years, did a really good job on the roads and everything else, but he had several members of his family also in the township uh, system. An outsider ran who never held political office. All they said was, this is government corruption. This is this. These guys make 336000 a year between the four brothers and two people in the county. He got elected. And the first thing he did was he filed, uh, wanted to fire all the family members for patronage. But since they were members of a union, he racked up a lot of legal bills. The next thing he did was he painted all the township trucks pink because he was wanting to go with Women's Breast Cancer Awareness Day and thought we should do this. But it cost another $300,000 to get all the township trucks painted pink. And uh, he was uh, promptly ousted out of office after four years because he didn't maintain the roads. Don't you think that, a, uh, uh, and the thing is, he got a lot of people upset because, you know, he wouldn't go out. And another thing I heard is that they were maintaining the cemeteries in the area, you know, clearing brush and things like that. You know, the last guy we had was always really attentive to residents' needs, but he shut down the recycling center and he shut down the shut down some other stuff to save money and he just literally within within four years of his thing being in township he re-elected the old road commissioner and he's got things serviced back but he almost had a half million dollars in legal bills by the time he left you know sounds like the political process worked though and sounds like he was not able to stay in office um after um not giving the residents what they want yeah but uh you should uh <laughs> Mm -hmm. All the, all the, uh, man, it, it's, it was a mess out here for a while. I mean, you know, the township did a lot more than the people realized sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, just even getting the roads done and, you know, I could get into some local issues out here, but it seems like that's one of the few areas of government that really can address, besides a city that can address some of the local needs of the populace. Um, and you can do that through the annual township meeting and the special township meeting. So let's say, for example, you knew about that before. Maybe you would have been able to get a ballot qu um, question up there to fire the township. <laughs> have them resign. <laughs> Whatever the most politically correct way to do that. I, I, had, I had no idea you could do this. I mean, there you go. I mean, is it? Uh, never mind. I will suspend my questioning here. Who else has questions? Come on, guys. Go ahead, Ernie. I muted you, Ernie, so go ahead and unmute. A microphone at the bottom. On the lower left-hand side. There, uh, lower left. Just hit the 
unmute yeah. button. It's not working. You got it now. You're yeah. on. You're on. You're on now, me, Ernie. Sorry, Ernie. You you had it. You were unmuted before. I unmuted you. So go ahead and hit it one more time. Is your volume on your uh, keyboard uh, all the way you up? Can, you can, you can, you're, Ernie, you're unmuted now. Talk. You're, you're good. Uh, you're I good. am unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good yes. boy, Great. Ernie. I, I <laughs> thank you. I uh, apologize. Uh, we got in here late. Tom, Tom is here with me. Um, and I, to this point, I don't really understand the definition of a township. I know that, uh, well, Evanston is supposedly one. I lived there for many years. I now live in the mid north side of Chicago. And is the city of Chicago a township as well as a city? Or are there several townships within the within the uh, city? And what, what is the actual definition of a township? I'm not sure what the actual definition definition is. Um, let's look that up because it is on the presentation, I believe. Um, let's go. I'm gonna just share my screen really quick, and we'll just gonna do in, in different parts of the country, different structures of government evolve. In right, New England, it's the town. In the South, it's counties. In the Midwest, it's a blend. So we have a blend of between the, those two extremes. Yeah. All the township. Not sure if I'm gonna get the actual definition of a township for you, but how I know it as um, from my public education in Illinois, is yeah. it's the basic foundation of government in Illinois. It's the okay. first, this is the first, first um, step of government. And they were formed to make sure that um, people were served in the community services. Okay, well, tell, uh, is it above or below the city level in terms of jurisdiction or uh, between city and county or how does that work? So it is below the city, um, okay. but there are, it, it does overlap various, it can overlap various cities and villages and towns. Yeah. So the boundaries, like everything else in Illinois, are just different and they overlap with, with other jurisdictions. Um, yeah. And then Chicago is different because Chicago has the wards. So okay. everywhere else outside of Chicago, in typical Illinois fashion, is different than the city of Chicago. And so even okay. the suburbs in Cook fall underneath townships just yeah. not in Chicago. A township, well, was but there's no there's no township in Chicago. There's no townships in the in the city of Chicago proper. Okay. Well, the thing is, a township is uh, was defined as a area of when they did the plat of survey maps from the United States Geological Survey. Uh, each and every section and whatever there were so many sections that would make comprise a township. And that's where the township government level came in. Um, you had like the county, which was a certain number of townships, and then they had the uh, township level, and they got to the village. When it first started out, it was mainly for like agricultural and, you know, the basic functions of government. But, you know, when the when the United States is a lot uh, more rural, it was uh, done because they had that local area of government that could be used you know, mm -hmm. for, for the township level. And they were the ones responsible for like the one room schoolhouses and all that stuff in the early part of the 18th century. And they were defined, you know, like I said, you had the farm lands and everything else. I don't know if you, uh, you uh, know what's going on with the United States Geological Survey, plat of survey, but those are the ones that designated what townships were and the boundaries of them were already. And I mm -hmm. think the township level of government may be a little bit different, but I do know that you know, each state had one and then stuff like that, but that's that's how I've always understood it to be. Hmm. Right. You, know. you do have me wondering, um, you know, if my township came first or in my village came first. Or my uh, probably came. your township came first and then the right. county and then, and then the uh, village because mm -hmm. the villages had to get incorporated first and everything else. Okay, okay. Janice, you got a question? Go ahead. Janice, your um, hand is raised. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, my question is is actually in the chat. I go ahead. Wanted to, I wanted Anna to put um, that petition form into the chat. A uh, okay. link to it. Just save it in Google Thanks. Docs if you want to, and then you can just send it to us that way or just Google email. Have an email. Yeah, I'll do the Google Docs. I'll do the website with the instructions and then the, uh, on there is. Uh, I don't like Google Docs. Just give me the link. <laughs> well, she can't give you Google, the link. Google Google everything. Google has enough money. She, the thing is, Janice, she might not be able to share it with you. Get rid of Google. Google. I'll, I'll share it in a PDF version as well. Okay. For the link. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, because I know that you have to get it up on the web to share a link. Anyway, sorry about that. Who's next? I'll ask a question. If, uh, nobody else has one that hasn't gone. Um, but uh, okay, let me jump in there. I'm sorry, I just have a real short one. I want I want to know if Anna can come to my house and show me how to do all this stuff. <laughs> Where are you at? I, I can... Oh, I'm in, in Rogers Park. <laughs> oh yeah, I can zoom. <laughs> We can do a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> oh, I'll just put it in a PDF and I'll send it in front of I'm going, oh my yeah. God. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Anna, why don't you tell us about the, like the Greens lot. have a lot of Zoom meetings? Probably. We do have Zoom playing. meetings. Um, we have uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday, um, a weekly call. Um, we have that. Um, we have the third Sundays. We have our coordinating committee. Um, we have various, um, uh, our chapters put out various events, um, some of it's on Zoom, so, you know, everybody can join. We actually have um, the, uh, a, a petition um, training um, slash status update um, social coming up the fourth Wednesday of February. And so, let me get out my calendar, just make sure I have the right date. So that's February 23rd, and I'll get out the link to that too. Um, so come learn more, come give us a status update, or just simply come by and say hi. So we'll have a social at the end. So this is really exciting. The team is really has been enjoying um, doing this uh, grassroots democracy. I believe if you go to the Green uh, Illinois Green Party main page, you'll find a plenty of links to there and a zoom to the zoom calendar yeah okay here's my question it's do you you know my experience was pretty painful and disappointing in terms of being on the ballot and then being backstabbed i felt like by uh for being anti-semitic yeah but so the you know, I mean, do y'all, I, I think it's not just the Green Party. I think all the parties are, um, I think I, you know, idealistically before I got involved with politics at all, thought that y'all would be actively recruiting the, the best and the brightest. But, you know, you know I even saw that um, Rich Whitney, um, you know, uh, stepped down angry because of, you know, some, some issue over trans, sexual it i mean like you know how can america get past i mean it got me when you said look it sounds like politics worked and i'm like i mean i don't see politics doing anything constructed other than undoing policies and you know i mean i think the best thing we could do is prove that it was a crime for all the corruption they did in terms of undoing honest service laws, uh, you know, um, EPA defunding, every liberal green issue you have uh, was, de you know, was sabotaged uh, using dirty politics. I, I don't know. I just, but how, I know you were like the secretary or something of the Green Party. You know, how are y'all dealing with this as a huge management organizational issue? Yeah, we actually, actually, I am the organizer. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not um, in the executive committee. Um, right. So we have, um, sometimes you just can't win them all. And um, when there's two candidates um, who are vying for the same spot and the people choose one over the, the other, you know, unfortunately that is democracy. 
But, but uh, that was that the people, I mean, there might've been 20 people and oh, if you're new, you can't be in it. I mean, it wasn't representative. It wasn't inclusive. I don't know how many people are in the party, but I felt like Steve Alesh of the Green Party came in there and said, I'm in here and I'm gonna get about 20 pro-Israeli Zionist Rama uh, Amin we don't allow, hey, hey, And hey, that, you know, and so call me anti-Semitic, but I'm anti-Zionist. And I think that's what got me pushed out. Them. Excuse me, I'm talking, Charlie. Okay, no, you have you nothing to do with this. Hey, Just one full time, Charlie. guys. One yeah. full time. Not your face, yeah. Charlie. You, yeah, you're Charlie, the best stabbing time. organizer of this whole group. Okay, yeah. so let me talk for once. That's no what free personal speech is. Attacks, please. Free speech. You took over the free speech forum of this thing, and that's how you're you're orchestrating the entire takeover. Oh, of America. Ellen, I take I okay? take so, exception to that. You know, I don't need. The only reason I'm here is. You know what free speech is? You have to know no. what free speech isn't. It's when it's how people are sabotaging all the liberal Green Party voices and, and substituting them with fakes, you know, right? And that's what I've come to see the problem is in America. That we, I mean, you can read all this literature in the world and all you have are non-issues pushed by politicians based on fake, you know, we've been infiltrated by the, by the ultra Zionist or some corrupt Luciferian Illuminati sect, right? And through the CIA and the FBI, all we can do is get an issue into the forum. If they're they're loving, they're but there's no right. free speech, okay? Okay, Ellen, right. we can, let's move on to our next it's, question. It's a culture war, and we can't do it through politics. That's right. All right, all right Ellen. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Brian. I did. I've I've always invited for her for Ellen and anybody else who wants to run for office. Come on, bring, come on in. Let's see. Let's fill out a questionnaire. So I put um uh, our um our link on there. So when she gets back, maybe we can remind her as well. And I also said it on this uh, on this uh group too. Come on in. Fill out a questionnaire. It's All right, sad. Brian, uh, or let's get our libertarian oh. guys in here. So uh, come on, on in and start, start asking away your questions. So, Anna, sorry I missed the presentation, um, but would the Green Party be interested in signing a statement of sorts that's on – it's a statement that's a resolution against the drug war kind of get like a bunch of groups to sign this thing and kind of you know kind of bring unity over a common issue is this something the green party would be interested in deliberating on and participating in well it does sound something that the team would be interested in um go ahead shoot that over to me we do have a coordinators meeting on uh, february 19th um, at 7.30, so we'll get that in front of them. All right, and I got another question for and we you. we always like to, I mean, we have worked with the Libertarian group before on issues, including COVID, COVID relief of 2020, so. Why should somebody Thank vote, you. Uh, why should somebody vote green instead of Libertarian? The environment. That's it, just the environment? Yep. It's a big one. So that's one of the main issues is the environment. And is there any others? Oh, I'm sure that there is others. And the libertarians that are in the Green Party, uh, they do have, you know, everybody has their own personal, unique um, perspectives and mm -hmm. um, experiences. Um, and so we welcome we welcome those unique experiences. Um, we do have the 10 key values for our members. And we just roll them, roll down them right now. Um, and so the libertarians that are in um, that are in our group, um, you know, they do one of their mainstays is it, it, the environment what is not so much talked about in the libertarian group, and it's talked about in the green group. So just based off of my experience with the libertarians, that is that is one one of the biggest reasons why they are also um, green party members. Um, so our 10 key values are grassroots democracy, social justice and equal opportunity, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, decentralization, community-based economics, feminism and gender equity, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, future focus and sustainability. And so when I hear from our anarchists, from our Democrats, from Republicans, 
when I hear that they run these 10 key values and it spoke to them and they agree with all of these and they want to be part of this larger organization, this larger political party who runs candidates on a non-corporate strategy, they just kind of resonate with, with the larger group. And I think that's kind of what makes us special is that we're just not one or the other or you know, a, a random third option, we bring a good coalition, we have good diversity of political views, of social economic status, um, of uh, religion, um, sex, identity, all these unique perspectives um, coming in. So I can't speak, you know, like on a um, one for one basis, but generally the libertarians that I know in the Green Party come here because of the environmental concerns. Okay, Bob Matter, you got the next question. Um, yeah, I, you know, it seems to me like um, the uh, that the Green Party has been basically just absorbed by the Democratic Party. I mean, what can somebody get from the Green Party that they can't already get in the Democratic Party? You guys sound like uh, you're, you know, sound like the same same thing. I mean, it seems like the Democrat, the new left Democratic Party stole all your thunder you all want more government you want you know dependence on unreliable energy uh the, all this uh woke nonsense i mean you know equity and inclusion and diversity and all that why what there's no difference i mean isn't why doesn't the green party just fold up and admit that they're just they're just uh, a, a, a democratic wing we are not democrats we are pro, we are pro peace we are uh, Charles is shaking his head. Um, we <laughs> we well, are different. We are against well, fracking. We are not. We don't take corporate contributions. There is a big faction in the yeah. Democratic Party. If you have not noticed already, where there's corporate Dems and there's progressive Dems, and the progressive Dems don't don't want to vote for corporate. They, Dems. Don't, they don't want. They don't want nuclear power either. Plus, you get a if you go if you go Democratic instead of Green Party, you get a free crack pipe. <laughs> well, the Green Party is very different from the Democrat Party. We actually stand behind the values. We stand behind our words. When we say we're against fracking, we actually mean we're against fracking. All right. Uh, Raj, you had your hand up yes. earlier. Yes. You want to ask a yes. question, please? Yes, I have a question. I mean, what Green Party really do? It looks like you are everywhere. Well, I mean, going. how can you accomplish? Are you on his email list? I mean, it's, it's a very focused thing. Give, give and and, and I, I don't understand. I don't understand from what you have said so far. And what do you mean? What is Green Party do really? What is what is your central focus? And why are you into so many other things? And uh, liber Libertarian Party comes and says, oh, welcome. Well, why do you want to have political party into that? And you say you do not want Democratic Party, but you want Libertarian Party. I mean, what's going on? We don't. Do? <laughs> we work with those who want to work with us. We align sometimes. We align with the libertarian parties on being third parties. So when we work together on the COVID relief lawsuit, we put our resource together. So sometimes I feel like it's a Venn diagram where there's a big circle here and a big circle here. And in the middle, we can work together. And that's compromised. And that's working but together. What, 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 as a Green Party, as a Green, what is Green Party focus? What, you, what is Green Party means? What you are trying to do, basically? Well, okay, the main thing that we're doing is one thing. Sure. The main thing that we're main thing that we're doing is focusing on the environment, and we're focusing yeah. on having the car uh, zero carbon emissions by twenty thirty. Yeah, that's what you say. And, and then, our government not realistic. And so far, you are on everything, but that you are not talking about the green thing. You're talking about all kinds of these, 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 these. You know, you're talking about politics. You're talking about fund raising funds. You're talking taxing people. You're talking about all other things, but nothing about green came out so far. 
Only about three more. Okay. Ernie, so please silence. Ernie. Yeah. Ernie. Yeah. You want me to ask? Okay. I have a question about the relation. What is the relationship between the Green minute, Party and the minute. U.S.? Okay, no, no, Ernie. Ernie, Ernie, hang on. Charlie, then Brian, then you, if you don't mind, okay? Because we had two others before you did when you raised your hand, and I'll be more than happy. Oh, okay. Question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so put Charlie next, and then Brian, the Henny, and then Ernie. So Charlie, okay. go ahead with your. Well, go ahead. Well, and did you answer his question about? At, did you have sufficient time about the Greens being a general party? Oh yes, let me. I wanted to finish that. Yes, thank you, Charles. Um, so. This is also, we like to focus on the environment and the 2030 date. So that's our main strategy. But also with grassroots democracy, you have these little issues. And so you have leaders in local communities who are working on um, their needs, on accomplishing their needs. Um, like we're in a coalition with um, the, no, the utility shutoffs to have no utility shutoffs, no water shutoffs. And so that's a very immediate need. Um, so, and we welcome to work with that coalition and that coalition has 52 uh, other organizations, um, or at least it did at one time, um, to work together towards these things. So we might disagree on other things like floor or um, uh, fracking, but we agree on these things. We agree that people shouldn't have their water shut off when they need to wash their hands. And so, you know, that is something that we can move forward with. And so just sometimes we have, we like to cherish the grassroots democracy. So if those local people feel that there's so much of a need to go ahead and press their government on non, you know, on not top, on, on the not main agenda, then that is what they're welcome to do. Thank you. You're welcome. So, sorry, I'll mute here real quick. Go ahead, uh, Brian. What about me? Was uh, Charlie next? Charlie. Um, so I, I, I think sometimes come. that the difference between uh, people in their views isn't necessarily the end, but it's the means. Like, mm -hmm. I would, as a person, I, I agree with like this idea that we should have a clean environment, that people who pollute the environment should be responsible for it, that we need to clean up toxic waste, reduce some of the uh, more harmful energy sources, or you know, try to replace those with something cleaner. Like I agree entirely. I, you know, it's the question of how to do that. Like as I look at the environment, I think of the EPA, I think of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, you know, so much of what has happened to our environment is the direct result of government involvement, government providing protection to polluters, the oil industry, nuclear energy, coal, um, you know, mineral extraction. Those are very high polluting, very toxic industries, but they're absolutely necessary to sustain the economy. So, uh, you know, when it comes to, so I think where we disagree with the libertarians and the greens is, is the means. So, you know, I would think that one of the ways to deal with this is to, re to remove some of the limited liability that's offered through uh, the corporate structure. And when considering, you know, how to deal with pollution rather than creating some big government bureaucracy, if the, the effects of polluting affected the individual shareholder directly and it wasn't protected by this corporate shield i mean is that something that the that the green party like you know like i'm just trying to find how, where do we find common ground right in the means and and so i wanted to get your thoughts on, on an idea like that okay just so i understand your question it's how do we find common ground on what energy sources, what environmental uh, uh, items we can do, we can propose to turn this ship around. Is yeah, that... I mean, things, things that, you know, the, the means by which it's done, right? I, you know, like, because I'd say government, no, 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 no government, right? Let's remove the government in some way. And, and, you know, I think the Greens would be more in favor of creating a bureaucracy, passing a law, 
Um, so, you know, where, where do Greens and Libertarians find common ground as it, as it relates to the means by which the, the social end is achieved? So, the social end being a cleaner environment. First, I'm going to say, and I'm not sure if, if your candidates, do they take corporate con contributions? They'll take money from anybody, anytime. Not all of them. <laughs> Well, so some don't even solicit uh, donations. Yes. We, so I, I did not. I did not take any money, but other people do. Okay. Yeah. We resolve um, uh, corporate ties with our elected officials. As long as they're green elected officials, that is a non-issue. We do not take corporate contributions. And to me, that if we, if even if it's still allowed and the candidates, we, it was important to the people for them not to take corporate contributions. And I know it's public information if people know how to look for it, but if we can start taking corporate money out of the politicians' campaigns, I think that will help level the playing ground and allow the power of the people to flourish. And as far as the environmental means, we um, there, there is a whole host of things that what, what we, um, proposed in the eco-socialist Green New Deal. Um, so there are things that we are proposing um, that most likely could be favorable to some libertarian people or candidates as uh, sensible solutions to be able to uh, move forward with our environmental demands. Thank you. All right, Ernie, I, Charlie, I don't know if you went left next or not, but I'm, I'm, do you mind if Where I Ernie go? Okay, Ernie, go ahead. Yeah, quick question um, about the structure, the international structure. What is the relationship between the American Green Party and are there big differences within the country of different Green Parties? And is there a national headquarters? And what is the relationship between um, the U.S. Green Party and in Germany, I know they're strong, and in other places around around the world. On um, the Illinois Green, I mean the Illinois Green Party, the Green Party, um, we we are in seventy two countries, um, and I am on the state level, so I do not know too much about our national and international connections. I do get to see a glimpse of it every once in a while, um, and I think I haven't heard. Uh, I know the Germany Green Party was in uh, the news. Um, they were, uh, and, I, and I have not followed through if they actually won that uh, campaign, but I know that they were being in the majority. Um, in a Gallup poll from last year, 62% um, of Americans that were polled wanted a third party. Um, so mm -hmm. if any, everybody who wants a third party was able to agree on a third party and vote on it, we would not only take it, but we would take it with an 11 point lead as well. Um, so there is a lot of this um, catch 22 in the US where um, a lot of people don't wanna leave their comfort zone of voting for their established party, but they also want something different. And so it's like every day, but election day, they want something different. Um, so we need to make sure that if, if you want something different, gotta vote different. Um, but as far as the international and national, um, we, I, I know that there are some events, you know, that happen once in a while, but as far as like coordinated, uh, and we do international days of, um, of actions, um, um, sometimes um, we do sign some uh, uh, issue statements, um, but um, it, it is nice to uh, know that we are in 72 countries. Well, are, are, are the, the policies from the American Greens and the European Greens, are they pretty much the same? Is there a lot of, it seems there's, to me they are, but I don't know. Yeah, there's everybody uh, as a Green has the same, same 10 key values. Um, I do know in, I don't know if it's Britain or United Kingdom, one of the jurisdictions there, I think it's, I think it's just Britain, um, where they are actually pro-nuclear, um, where I think that's the only uh, pro-nuclear green party that there is in, internationally. So um, uh, obviously there are differences of, of policies, um, but as far as being a green, 
march to the same 10k values. Okay. Okay, uh, Charlie, I guess you're next, and then we go to Brian. Okay, first of all, I, before I ask, I'd like to give a little history to Ernie's question. There was an Illinois Greens, or Chicago Greens, which I was. We also had an Illinois Greens, which is a nonprofit environmental organization. In order to run candidates for president of the United States, the Greens had to establish parties in each state. And so those Illinois Greens went through the necessary uh, paperwork to be established as a statewide political party. That's where the, and so they, uh, it's even today, we're the Chicago Greens slash Illinois Green Party. We as well became- What's your question, Charlie? I said I was going to answer his question first, sir. Why don't you listen? Are libertarians incapable of, of honoring professionally? Thank you. My question is, all the demographics seem to indicate that every young person in the United States, and particularly the state of Illinois, is pro-environment. And I noticed that the Greens in Illinois, I guess you won a big election. You got a mayor elected. And I believe you're opening offices in different locations in the suburbs. It looks like the Green Party. Can you tell us what's the status is of the Green? And you got a, you're putting together quite a slate of candidates. It looks like the Greens are going to move and are going to take over the state of Illinois. Is that correct? Um, well, we are um, having candidates. They are running for office. Um, some of them are winnable. Um, and so we are definitely marching uh, to make sure that we do get a government that um, we deserve. Okay. All right, Brian. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, uh, you the grassroots democracy, or excuse me, uh, you said decentralization is a uh, is one of the core values. All right, so kind of to, to to go off what Brian was saying, like means and like uh, the means with the you know desired ends. For example, the DSA in Chicago wants to democratize ComEd or whatever. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. I'd be opposed to it as a libertarian. I think, though, that buying stock in Exelon and getting a bunch of Green Party members and DSA members and libertarians to buy Exelon stock and go to a Exelon meeting and force change that way might be a better means than to use government force or government tax dollars to buy out the uh, property of the electric company. <laughs> um, but, to your, but to your point of decentralization, to the point of decentralization, can I, I am, can you help me understand how you can reconcile supporting decentralization while maybe some of the national candidates, say like uh, Howie Hawkins, uh, supports like a a federal federal level Medicare for all or federal <laughs> level anything. Um, I think me personally as a libertarian, I I would be more uh, open to the Green Party if if by this decentralization they they were more about decentralizing things instead of top down. So if you want to, would you mind touching on that? If you Sure, sure. And don't forget, entity, some of the entities are supposed to be sovereign. States are supposed to have their sovereignty. Um, the federal level is supposed to be with foreign policy, not so much on the local state level. Imagine if our politics now was what happened at the, when this country was founded. It would be unbelievable because when this country was founded, it was states were so sovereign. Your city was sovereign. Your school boards were sovereign. So it's all about sovereignty. And the federal level was there as united, as to have 
work on foreign issues and be there for the and be there on not state level issues. But now we have federal level issues. Big education, big pharma, big this, big that, big corporate contributions that our government just allows. And the system is run on these corporate contributions. We need so much money to run for office, be in office. Well, we are still, our states are still sovereign. Our political subdivisions are still sovereign. We need to have, retain that sovereignty um, and put our federal level back to where it's supposed to be. Does that help answer the question? Uh, I, I disagree that we still have sovereignty. I think we don't have sovereignty. And I think that's why things are so polarized because you have too many people wanting to rule from the top down that, you know, uh, it, it, you know, we're supposed to be, it's supposed to be bottom up, not top down because it is top down. And because the federal government basically is everywhere, it now matters who the president is and who, you know, and, in the Constitution, it says that the Congress had to meet just once a year. Like it, now it's expected Congress meets. You know, um, I don't, and, and we can't afford to do all these things on the national level. So I think that yeah, I think that the Green Party would be would be better selling your ideas on a state level instead of like Medicare for all. You know, on a federal, I think a much more uh, a different approach might be Cook County uh, Cook County system. Yeah or a statewide system that maybe even, more, and because it is, you know, a more locally administered uh, system, libertarians may be more open to accepting it as a compromise of, or, or a step in the right direction from the status quo. We were to keep some of our money here instead of going to the federal government, I think that would be able to, to work out. These guys do this before. But to me, the abolish the federal income tax, <laughs> and then your problem solved. Yeah, I've been big on the involved in a lot. She's not really right. Well, maybe not problem solved, but that's one good step. Abolish the income tax at the federal level. Appeal the Sixteenth Amendment. I think the Green Party would get a lot of votes if they voted to to appeal the federal income tax. <laughs> Do it. I mean, if for decentralization, you don't need a national top-down taxing body. And that's not sensical. Hey, this is one foot at a time, Charlie. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Right. Let me just say it was a, it's a pleasure uh, talking to you and meeting you. <laughs> this will not be the first time we'll be we'll we'll meet. Well, it will be, but or, in other words, <laughs> the in other only words, time. This will not be the only time. In other words, she's gonna come out and uh Get you guys going. Wait till wait till I get that at McHenry County Libertarian Party. All right, who's next on the questions? Or yeah, no. I have one. Go ahead, and then we'll go to Bob. Go ahead, now, Jeremy. Given modern technology, the college of complexes has been able to decentralize instead of just being located in one location in Chicago, Illinois. You now have people attending from across the country and even in Canada. Uh, arguments for decentralizing seem to be ignoring modern communication. <laughs> I mean, technology, uh, how do you think multinational corporations came about? There's advances to say that we're going to go somehow backwards in time. And to localize administration is, I gotta wonder if that makes any, I mean, there the Greens say, act locally, think globally. What's the question, Charlie? Have the solution. All right, uh, any, any response? If not, we'll move on to Bob Matter. Go ahead, Bob. Um, yeah, and um, I was wondering uh, what what are the demographics of the of the Green Party as far as like um, the, you know men, women, LGBT, uh, black, Latino, etc. And that's 
part one. And then part two, uh, this is a little outside of our scope here tonight, but I was just wondering if you heard the news story about uh, France is entering into what they call their nuclear renaissance and Macron announced that they're building 14 new nuclear plants. And they already get 70% of their power from uh, uh, nuclear energy. So I'd like to kind of know your, your, your take on that. And, uh, and that's about it. Uh, so I'm with the Illinois Green Party. So I'm on the state level. Um, it's hard to say what our demographics are in, re in regards to race, um, gender identity. Um, we welcome everybody. Um, so, and I uh, don't know um, what everybody is. Um, uh, in regards to, we don't have the polls. We don't like to say, pick who you are because we don't really, uh, gender is fluid um, uh, and uh, race can, is more than just pick a few check boxes or, or, or whatnot. So we've never done like a demographic poll, but um, I mean, we, we have people from all walks of life. Um, so it is an interesting uh, place to be, and, and we're able to get that uh, wide diverse of uh, unique views and perspectives because we do we do have a wide base of demographics. But in regards to ratio and percentages, um, I don't know. We've never never took a poll for that. Um, and in regards to France, um, you know, with more and. I'm not sure, are these traditional water-based uh, uranium uh, nuclear plants or are they um, like China where they have the thorium salt molten reactor? I have not um, been briefed. Yeah, on I don't that. think they're thorium. I, re I read one newspaper article about it and they didn't, they didn't mention thorium. You know, they, I think they're just gonna be regular, you know, uranium plants. That's not good. It is a uranium plant. Hmm. I think that they have an opportunity and a chance, you know, to seek different future energy. We really need to not rely on this energy that we know radioactive for a hundred thousand years that is going to to stay with us on this planet. I think we have a great opportunity not to invest in these power plants. And um, I hope the France team uh, can uh, uh, work some green magic out there and uh, hope that if they you know, we can maybe we can reach out to them and work together with them, if not already. Future is fusion. And a fusion has the investors, they have money, they have science, and everything moving so fast that everything else will be out. Fusion will be the thing for the next century. And they also have corporate contributions going into um, elected officials, uh, campaign funds, and um, to me, um, that also that needs to end um, to start the healing process. Okay, uh, Brian, and then Ernie. Okay, Br Br uh, Brian, you got to unmute. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, and maybe the, if you covered it in your presentation, I'm sorry, and. I, and, I, and maybe it's a little bit of a broad question, but it, what are your thoughts on like the public private partnerships using taxpayer money and resources along with private enterprise to achieve, um, you know, certain, uh, I guess, you know, zero emission, you know, certain environmental uh, benchmarks. It, it, um, is, is there something in the design of a program like that that you think would um, <clears throat> ensure that the that the end is achieved with the most efficient use of taxpayer uh, resources? Yeah. So um, I was looking for the website that has that has it where um, with part of the uh, uh, Green New Deal, the Eco Socialist Green New Deal where we have the eminent domain over the public utilities and they become employee owned. Um, so that that is one way we can have public utilities really public um, and not so privatized um, and then in the hands of the employees 
um, where they are, it's, it, it, br it brings the community-based economics portion of it. Does that answer your question or is there still something more that needs to be asked? I was. Well, I, I you know, so I, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how I feel about all that stuff, you know, like, you know, expropriating public utilities, um, creating co-ops, you know, maybe with locals that contribute to the creation funding of a, of a power plant, like that kind of stuff, it, de decentralization, like having power creation facilities owned by the people who use them. Like, I agree. That's a, I mean, I agree. I would agree with that end. I think that's a good end. I question how competitive it would be. I question how it's financed, um, you know, uh, and how it's maintained, that that kind of stuff. So I, I, I was just thinking in, in terms of the design of, a, so I don't, like, again, the a program like that in and of itself, I don't know that there's anything wrong with it. It's a matter of how it's implemented. And so how would you see something like that being implemented where it doesn't turn into, you know, where, the the elites pilfer the the poor who who build them a nice power plant that they then profit off of at our expense into perpetuity right you, you know what i mean and that's where the employee owned comes in where you know like a co-op the employees would own that and so you know hopefully in, in a world where there's there's uh good apples and if there's one bad apple then those nine good apples would help that one bad apple, or if they can't help them, like Tim's uh, 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 township person, get them out. Um, so there is there. So there is. Um, I think to me, I would rather have my employee owned than by a private company because I know those employees are going to take care of it, that they're going to take the ownership part of it. And that they are going to a either deliver great quality services or b somehow the political process will have to get them out. Brian, can you name one private part public private partnership that has benefited a community anywhere in the world that I think has been a benefit to the community? Yeah, a PPP. The the utility companies, the, the railroads, the telephones, I, I you know, like, look, I, I'm not someone who thinks that government like I'm not one of those anarchist libertarians, like government has resources that it would be very, very difficult for private people to muster. They have the government has authority to use eminent domain in a way that private parties cannot. So I, I don't necessarily agree that government can sometimes be the only way to do something that needs to be done. I just question how often that power is used, to what extent it's used, and, and, and what are the results of that use? I, I mean, like the phone company, as a taxpayer, I paid for it, and I've been getting jacked by the phone company for 50 years. I, I mean, you know what? It's, it's like I paid to make these guys rich, and then I'm paying to keep them rich, and and, and they stiff me with a forty dollars late fee once a month. You know what I mean, or every other month. You know, you know what I mean. So it's just like I'm getting jacked into perpetuity from something that seems like a good idea, you know. And then, you know, hey, here's your forty dollars late fee, you know. So we should sell our water system to a private company. And, and, and no, I, I would think you'd want the water company to be owned and by the people who use it, the people who use the that government. water. By the government. No, the government no, not, doesn't do not, that not shit, your, Charlie. Not your government. I mean, you can have, like, you know, you can define ownership in any way you want to. And ownership can be held jointly and severally by the people. You don't, like, people can have an equity interest in the, in the assets of the government. It doesn't have to be in control of some, like, government corporation run by these politicians. There's a different way to do things. It's just a matter of how and, and, and whether or not anybody would have the will because now the way you the want system the is right system, now, it works. You want the water the system guys. of our city to be owned by a private company for profit. The water no, that's not, he didn't say that at all, idiot. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's not what I said at all. That's a PVP. That you can have, like, the individuals, the who, the, the residents, the people who live there exactly. can have an ownership interest in public assets. Why not? They'd be nuts to do that. Uh, yeah, look at some of the companies. Well, that's the water. It costs you $100. Huh. <laughs> Well, that's I doubt it. it. When you have monopolistic power. Yeah, or any had you seen what happened? Right. In the, hey, there was a whole organization against privatization of water across Illinois. And look what happened to the British, what happened to Scotland when they renationalized their railways. That's another thing. They didn't they do so did it. They right. nationalized all the trains. All the right. well, and and what I'm suggesting work. is if they tr had transferred ownership of those railroads to the people the sure. individuals who make up the population, if they got an ownership interest and they said, <clears throat> here you go, people, figure out what to do with these railroads, I'll bet people would have figured something out and I'll bet they would have made some cash off of it. But no, you know, government's got to transfer it to their buddy, you know, who happens to have, you know, $20 billion to invest in a railroad that he probably got from the government. Yeah, the government probably the, the railroad was the the railroad had you know exist because the, the it was it was land the government conquered. Right, like like I'm there's more than one way to do something. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, get Ernie, you got the you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, of course. You know, I, I think I asked a week or two ago. Uh, what do you think in a of, uh, you know, what are the chances, a preliminary question, what are the chances that a, the Greens or the Libertarians or any other minor third party is ever going to achieve a position of importance in the United States, considering our system of government? Uh, and can, can anybody name, I don't think we've ever had a president that's been from a, from a uh, third party. We have a few over the years, maybe a few Congress people have come from uh, third parties, but not very many. Uh, what about a parliamentary system of government? Uh, do you think that would help the Greens and the Libertarians and the other uh, third parties other than the Dems and the Republicans? Yeah, I'm not sure about being a parliament, um, if that will help third parties or not. I'd have to research that aspect. Um, but in regards to um, how, in regards to third parties uh, being in important and being uh, in more prominent positions, um, sixty. I, I would, I'm not sure if you were on, but sixty-two. There was a recent Gallup poll where sixty-two percent of Americans who were polled want a third party. So if everybody who wanted a third party picked a third party. Um, we would not only win, but we would also win with an 11 point lead. What happens is it's a catch 22. Everybody wants to be on a winning train, but they also want to make sure that you are winning before you get on that train. So if everybody who wanted that, who, who vote, to me, the voters vote. So if you vote with your conscience, if you vote with your heart, it is never a wasted vote. If we all took the leap in 2022 and said, we want a different government and that requires voting differently. And everybody circled in uh, for green candidates. Guess what? Green candidates would win. Third parties would win. But it's, it's, it's this, I think this guilt sometimes of going outside your comfort zone of what about everybody else? Um, what if my vote's a wasted vote? Well, that's your vote. Nobody gets to tell you what to do. Nobody has to, nobody owns your vote. So if you vote with your conscience and you vote with your heart, it will never be a wasted vote. And if everybody who voted, who wants a third party, voted for a third party, we would get those prominent seats. Um, right now we do have, in 2021, we do have the mayor of Galesburg, who is a green uh, party member. Um, so we did celebrate that victory. Um, he's doing a wonderful job out there, um, and uh, we do have um, some some uh, 
candidates in office. I'm, uh, I mean, candidates who are running for office in 2022. I'm a candidate for State House District um, 85. Um, I ran last time as a grain, and over a few short months, I got on the ballot in July of 2020, and, and by November 2020, um, it was actually a new area for me. Um, and I reached over ballot line, and I would have established that district if it was not a redistricting year. So I know that it's possible for us to be breaking into these uh, areas. I know it's possible for, for third parties to get in there, even though it's an uphill battle with signature requirements and it's an uphill battle of getting uh, of uh, getting recognition to even receive an endorsement invitation because normally they're done um, in March and April before third parties in Illinois are allowed to even file for candidacy. So. Uh, the Greens have started earlier um, for 2022. We already had one town hall meeting um, one, uh, in January. So we are starting earlier. We have started starting stronger. Um, so it is all about pushing forward. But I also believe that the times are changing. I also believe that there's political factions out there that uh, the major two sides of the aisles are, are just uh, enfranchised with their political party. And when I go out canvassing, sometimes I'll get people at the door and they'll be like, Republican or Democrat? And I will say neither. And you can just see them melt. And then they just like welcome you and like, wow, okay, let's talk more. And so I do, from my experience going door to door, my experience with working with the Illinois Green Party and working with different groups, I, I, I see that there is a shift. So whether or not that shift can happen um, in the next nine months to for people to feel comfortable enough to vote with their heart and vote with their conscience and, and possibly vote Green Party, that that I hope will will happen. But we still have um, we still have almost all year. We have like nine more months before we get the, that chance to see that. I want to point out Tom. Tom Durkin, sitting behind me here, ran for the Green Party Illinois Senate and got 19% of the vote against Heather Staines. How, what year was oh. that? Go Tom Durkin. 2008. You want to run again? <laughs> well, probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, is it too late, Anna? What is the time frame to get on the ballot? Um, um, there is no uh, for the Green Parties and third parties. Um, we start petitioning April 13th. The filing is, um, I know it ends the 11th of July. I think it's, uh, so it's basically from April 13th through July 11th. And if you look in chat, um, I think if you scroll up in chat, I didn't leave you a link out there for ilgp.org resources slash resources slash for candidates. Um, so there you can have, um, you, there's information for candidates. And so there's questionnaire, the questionnaire that you filled out before, same questionnaire. Um, so we do welcome people to fill out their questionnaires uh, if they want to run for office. What? And, but is that different than the two big parties? And how many, ball, how many signatures do you need? Um, I really yeah. think it's so confusing. I, it should be like a level playing field with, you know, that's in the newspaper. <laughs> Come down here if you want to run, you know, and everybody has equal signatures. I, it is really a stacked deck. I, you know what I mean? They, they, it's like it's just going to favor the incumbent. <laughs> the Democratic Party, I got involved. They said, you know, we don't run anybody against a Democrat. If a Democrat has the office, we're not going to help you at all. If, you know, but go get us some signatures. I'm like, sure. Yeah, right. Thanks a lot. I mean, it, that's what's so weird is you it's no surprise you got a bunch of corrupt incumbents right and a democratic party machine that picks everybody who's you know but without even telling you you know it's that's what just is so shocking to me that there's it's a supply side corrupt system it comes from the top and it's it's a monopoly you know i mean and so you know there's a slight little encouraging the guy the mayor from you know, Podunk got in there, but we've got to What's break that monopoly. 
Um, how can we break the monopoly? You know, this is not representing- How can we break video. the monopoly? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. To, to run uh, Green Party candidates, get those Green Party candidates um, out for uh, endorsements, get them with non-corporate PACs, get them um, in front of canvassers, uh, in front of people's doors, social events, community events. Um, she left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I, can, I can hear well, you. I was gonna oh, it's not going to work. I mean, the, look at the marketing. Check out the libertarian research. party. I think your ideas are in line with theirs, Ellen. Yeah. The libertarian. Hey, Charlie, party. one full at a time. Anna's talking. None of them work. I don't know how to, nothing <laughs> works except changing hearts. Charlie, and one full. And, and de making corruption illegal. And I can't f find a honest justice department or you know anybody to take that up a church commission you know or something yeah, some kind of commission against corruption in politics we believe the vaccines don't they're not going to vote nazis don't investigate or you know nazis if they've got a monopoly they're not going to uh you know look what's into your question corruption. i think you already asked how do we it. fight corruption in politics you know i mean just you how know, do we fight corruption in like, politics little people knocking on doors thank you and, and we've got to run ourselves how can we you can everybody save this for the uh, rebuttal uh, but, okay uh, well no i'd like to we need to discuss it i don't want to rebut i want to i want to be like an open Ellen, democratic Ellen, educational Ellen. conversation like they do at we the are, international socialist organization that's why i had to follow the rules yeah one fool at well, a time yeah the nazi rules you know that okay let me nazi answer rules. her question let me answer her question okay go ahead anna she's listening <laughs> um no but we can demand our elected officials not to accept corporate money we can go on the Illinois State Board of Elections websites and look at our state and uh, lower level candidates. Who are you accepting money from? I Call don't, them up. We don't take Call money, but up. they are, and the money's going to One full at a time and one question <laughs> per <laughs> round, please. Ellen. Ellen, you can hear An individual can't change a system. Especially all the individual. individual from a small party, you know, with no money. I mean, I don't know how you, the system has to be fair. It's like a baseball game or, you know, the way we run traffic. I mean, that we just have to all play with the same rules. But uh, you can save that for your rebuttal. It's really difficult now. Well, I think we've got to come up with ideas and that does stimulate ideas. Rebuttal. That's all we can do. Get the conversation going. This is social media, not one you know, one opinion, you know, rebuttal doesn't get anywhere. We've got to come to a consensus. All right. Who's, uh, I guess, uh, libertarian wrecking crew. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna, are you a Cook County resident? Registered? I'm not. I'm in DuPage. Oh, bummer. I was going to ask you if you would sign our petition because we are established in Cook County. I was going to ask if you, if you were in Cook County, you would sign our petition. Uh, and my, I guess my second prong question is how, how open would you as a can individual candidate be to endorsing candidates that are also, you know, other third party candidates. I've endorsed green party candidates in the past for the, the water reclamation board. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think they would be great. You know, I think the Green Party would be awesome in that position. So, uh, so would, would you be willing to endorse uh, candidates uh, that are not Green Party, but third party? Actually, uh, the DuPage County chapter, the chapter that I'm part of, we actually recognized, um, I know you, some people on here might cringe, but um, a non-corporate Dem, um, uh, last 20, 21 cycle. Uh, so um, I think that was the, I, I heard it was like one of the first times that we endorsed um, a different, somebody from a different party. So um, go ahead and I would welcome you to also um, go back to the, the chat on this and look up on the ilgp.org slash resources slash for candidates. There's the question there on there fill out the questionnaire and send it in and we'll have the team take a look at it. Um, but it's not, 
it's not like we've never done it before. And there are some non-corporate Dems um, that are uh, filling out that questionnaire and submitting it for the February 19th uh, coordinating committee. Um, so it's up to the team um, whether or not um, to, to recognize that. But I do thank you for um, welcome for for recognizing our MWRD candidates. Um, they we are doing that again this year. We are established there, um, so we'll um, I'll put the put their website down here and their petition is on the website. Um, so. Hopefully we can work together on that. Um, you said you're, you're established in DuPage? They're established in MWRD. Oh, oh yes. I, I would sign their petition, yes, for sure. Yes. Do that. And then where are you established at? Cook County. Uh, Cook County, uh, uh, McHenry Cook County, County, Kankakee County, DeWitt County, Champaign County, Tazewell County. Pe did I say Peoria? Uh, I think seven counties. I may I, I may be missing one. And then are you? Think, uh, uh, McLean County. McLean County. Are you still established after the redistricting? We we are fighting a lawsuit. At, yes, they gave us they gave us countywide offices. They get they didn't give us uh like the the county commissioners or. This, or the or the general assembly or congressional districts entirely within Cook County, and they're citing a DuPage uh, ru ruling from DuPage to be like, yeah, I mean it's a, an election year; they're only you know, but it doesn't make any sense because, of course, Cook County commissioner seats are not going to be outside of the county, or seats all entirely within the general general assembly that are entirely within Cook County are not going to change really much you know you're still going to have those those uh districts so we're suing them and we'll let you know how it goes and i'm watching the college we worked together last election cycle uh with with uh with the covid uh relief so uh and i'm glad you were i'm sure you said you ran in 2020 so that that's that you probably yes i'll say uh so you probably you know had to collect a very limited amount of signatures and i hope that helped you out yeah yeah it definitely got my foot in the door um obviously it wasn't a win um but it was a great stepping stone for this time around um even though i'm I would have established the district if it was not a redistricting year but it does um help with the uh uh, voter awareness and so that was that was very good um but um yeah let's let's make sure that we we stay con connected because i know some of the people some of my team members were trying to reach out to the libertarian uh -huh. party about um about possibly another lawsuit um and then oliver hall he said he w wasn't able to take on the case because of his capacity level um so we'll see <laughs> April is still a long time away from me, for me. <laughs> and with COVID going up and down, you, we don't know what, what's going to be happening in, uh, in April. <laughs> could be at zero, we can be at 13, we can be at eight, who knows. <laughs> All right, who's next? I, I know you guys are, go ahead, sir. Libertarian wrecking crew. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, now, go ahead. The, the um, well, like get getting established party status, like it matters a lot. Like you really see how the the system is skewed towards the two major parties. Like if you try to run against them, like just getting on the ballot. Like, you know, here in Chicago, they're paying, you know, people are taking like four bucks a signature. So if you have a race that, you know, requires 25,000 signatures, you're looking at, you know, paying a hundred thousand bucks and you're already like, just to get on the ballot, you need to start raising money just to get on the ballot, unless you run as a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> and, and that just makes it like... <laughs> Like right from the start, the system's against you. So, and then 
you know, then they pull stuff like this redistricting and gerrymandering and, oh, you know, yeah, the, your district's fully within Cook County, but you're only established countywide, not on the, on the district level. And it's like, you know, just some rule they made up just to do it, you know, try to keep people off the ballot and not participating in a democratic process. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I just figured the, uh, I mean, the Greens just have too many policies that, you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's a matter of implementation. And, you know, we might disagree on a lot of things. And I think that's the way just Americans are in general. I don't think too many people will disagree about the ends. It's like, how do you get there? And you know, people got different ideas about that stuff. But there's some there's some basic premises we can agree on, like a cleaner environment, and better schools and safer streets and a more prosperous country and, you know, a free and free and democratic fair elections, you know, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I, I don't know, you know, like the uh, libertarians, the greens, DSA. I mean, I, I mean, I'm a libertarian for sure because I'm a cynic, right? It, it's that I don't think you can create a government program that's going to be fair. I think as soon as you hand a big pile of money to a couple of people, they're going to start dipping their fingers in that money and they're going to find a way to dip a shovel into that money. And then they're going to pull up a backhoe and, you know, just start scooping it up. Um, and, you know, like, how do you fix that? You don't. I mean, you start to, you start diminishing the size and scope of government because that's the only way is to avoid creating these huge piles of cash with these few people in charge of it with all this power. I don't, it's just human nature. It's like an acceptance of human nature. So, so ethically speaking, as a, as a, it seems like the, the Green Party and these, you know, the more collectivist type of philosophies that they believe in, I don't understand the, the ethics of the collective. That somehow there's this idea that the collective is going to come up with better ideas and, and has some kind of authority beyond the authority of the individual. Yeah. So can you kind of reconcile the, the, the collective thoughts of the Greens with that of the Libertarians with your ethics? Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the uh, um, underlying policies of the Libertarian group, and I apologize for that. I've never researched. Um, I, I've... I've, I've read stuff um i've been on your website but i haven't devolved into the whole um a portion of that but for for the greens for it being a, a collective uh unit on the on the local level is the local people know their community the best do you think that the federal government knows my town woodridge as much as woodridge knows woodridge no the local people know who, who's in need, what they want, what they can have uh, within their budget and, and how, how to have those clean water, clean air uh, and uh, safe, safe streets and uh, a good education system. So to, to me, the Greens with, it, with, with their grassroots democracy and allowing the local people to be able to control um, their policies and control what's going on in their government. Um, that to me is a part of the decentralization, the community-based economics, um, and um, doing that yeah. is the personal responsibility um, as well in, in making sure that you live in the government that you want to live in. Um, what, what would be the limits you, that, that you would place on the local government? Like, what, what is the limits of the local government's authority? And, and that's where, like, you know, when I think of, you know, taxes, it's like everything you own can be expropriated from you at, at, at any time. And, and, you know, gun control that, you know, your right to possess certain thing is taken away from you. Like, where, where in, in your mind is the the limitations of government authority, even if it's local and it's democratic. I would I would stick with what's in the constitution. 
Um, I would stick with the 10th Amendment rights that whatever, if it's not explicit in the Constitution, then it belongs to the states. Sorry, or, läuft or, durch das Schulgebäude und schickt die Schüler nach draußen. Okay. Im Kunstraum <lacht> findet sie Lilly, die ein Bild malt. <lacht> Lilly, was machst du? Wir müssen nach draußen gehen. Okay, let's go with Bob Matters' question now, if you're done, Anna. Um, sure, it can be tough. Okay, Anna. Did it answer your question? It, it, it did. It, you know, the, the 10th Amendment or the, and the 9th Amendment that any rights not enumerated are reserved to the people. Then how do you how do you justify national health care and, you know, universal college? And if, if, you know, if you 10th Amendment. Um, that is um, a good question with the, with the national health care um, system that the Greens do want. Um, you know, it is not explicit in there. Um, you know, we do uh, vote for our elected officials and our elected officials do get to, you know, do get to decide on the legislation and the U.S. House uh, representatives um, are two year term. So every 756 odd days. We had a chance to go ahead and mute everybody. Um, no, Vicky just muted That's where the stuff was coming from, but <laughs> she's fine. Uh, keep going. So, to me, it's it is the system of of these this corporate contributions that um, you need so much money in order to to be running. You know, and the Greens, we are trying to. Make sure that we have a good government and our green candidates do not accept uh, corporate contributions. Uh, we, I, I really, truly, honestly believe that we want the power of the people to flourish. We have to uh, break our ties uh, with elected officials who accept corporate contributions. As long as those co corporate contributions are coming in, the power of the people is diminished. And um, if, the, if the power of the people are, are diminished, this is what we're getting. This is the system that we're getting. So it is very important for for third parties to sh to get on the ba ballot, even if it's a struggle. We have to we have to fight harder. We have to fight smarter. We have to fight earlier. We have to work together with other groups. We have to um, uh, take opportunities when we can in order to get ahead. Um, um, so. We also need the voters to understand that your vote is not a wasted but vote as long as you vote how you want to vote. That's nobody else's vote but yours. It's your right. Um, and um, yeah, so in regards to what we want on the national level, you know, that will be up to uh, the elected officials and the people. Okay. So, well, hey, I think Tim, somebody I else was ahead of me. I didn't get a chance to ask my question, Tim. Oh, I'm sorry about that, uh, Bob. Go ahead. My you know, apologies. See, okay. Anna, uh, back, bringing this back down to the local level, um, do, does the Green Party believe that parents should have a say in the curriculum uh, of their uh, children, uh, their children's education in school? I'm sure that they do. But and that's Green part Party. of the school board, and that's running for school board. The Green, the Green Party's in support of that. In support of parents of, having of parents choices of having, what they in their schools. Yes. Yes, I, oh, I would oh. believe that they would be. Okay. It's, it's been a little bit of a controversial issue around the country, and some, some Democratic, uh, you know, representatives have come out and said that, you know, parents have no business in setting curriculums for the schools and, and all that. Um, and, it's, and on that same uh, kind of level there, that looking at uh, what happened in Virginia kind of as a canary in the coal mine, is, uh, is the Green Party braced for the what looks like it's going to be the coming red wave, tidal wave in uh, 2022? Um, we, are, we are prepared to um, 
to work with groups and we are prepared to run our candidates um and we are and we are prepared um to speak on the environment so we the people it's not just a partisan issue democrats are concerned about this and they're not getting it from their their top level um elected officials biden wants fracking he's issued so many fracking permits um he wants he you know we might be going to war at some time some of the progressive democrats want that. there's lots of factions that are going on and we see that also with the republican party as well where they might not be trump supporters but they're still republican but they they're kind of lost in in in, in their republican home um because they are not not <laughs> They just are not Democrats. They have anywhere else to go. Um, so it's fairly hard when we have this government system of us versus them, but we're all together and we need to work together. And it's not just the two established parties in a democracy. We need to be able to have fair and free elections and we need to be treated um, equally um, when it comes to ballot access. Um, Party suppression is voter suppression. Brian would, would agree with me on that. So the more that they suppress the parties, the more that is, it is voter suppression. So, so I've been an activist for since the year 2000. I came through um, the anti-war and anti-corporate segments. Um, I was a uh, uh, a Democrat from 2006 to um, uh, 2018. Um, so I ran twice with them in DuPage. Um, I got up to the state level. Um, I was started talking about this position actually when I'm running for the 85th uh, state house position. I, I didn't like what I saw um, on the state level in the, in the Democratic Party. And I, I felt lost and it took me a few years to uh, find a new home, and um, when I found the Green Party, and I read the 10 key values, and started talking to people in the party, it was my agenda. It was my agenda for good environment, for good government, um, for non-corporate uh, 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 contributions. These were all items that have been with me for half of my life, and so I was happy to come back and march to the tune of my roots and believe and have my leaders be talking the same things that I talk about and they have my leaders um, believe in the same things that I believe in and if I was still a democrat I, I would not have that I would not be I'd be talking about anti about anti-fracking my leaders would not be talking about anti-fracking and I'd be talking about health care for all and my leaders would not be talking about health care for all so I did no longer wanted to be part of um, that that uh, party where they didn't my my lead I couldn't defend my leaders I couldn't defend my sure. candidates I, I couldn't do that anymore and so I had to break free from the system and I encourage and people who are lost I talked to a bunch of Dem Democrats today and they agree with me healthcare for all no fracking you know and so these are these are issues that people care about, but we need to have them not keep on electing them in office. Again, if they voted with their hearts and they went with their hearts, they might be green. Um, yes, I'm uh, next. I know you're next, Charlie, so go ahead. Yeah, and I'm, I don't know if I'm entirely sold about this notion, uh, such as the libertarians are inclined to believe that local control is always better. Now take, for example, Jim Crow laws in various fashions against voting. All of them were enacted across the South by the local government. What's your question, Charlie? Would you kindly, sir, let me ask it? He's just doing what you're doing, Charlie, all the time, so. I haven't been in mid-sentence. Honestly, Go ahead, Charlie. I will begin again. That you interrupted me. The 
Jim Crow laws, which affected many aspects of daily lives, were affected all across the country, particularly the South, by the local government. The only way this was corrected was by the passage of a national Civil Rights Act uh, to render those laws uh, invalid. Now, I only ask, I think local control is- What's your question, why, Charlie? Once again, I'll begin the question again. <laughs> Is incapable. You know, the libertarians need to understand that you are not the moderators. <laughs> yeah, oh. that's a good I thank you. Um, the I would However, think that local tradition. control would be defined by the matter under discussion, such as garbage collection or something of that oh, nature. Uh, it's, it's defined by the issue, oh. not as a general concept. <laughs> no, I'm kind of a connoisseur. Of Ernie, Ernie, please side yeah. mute. I'll I'll mute you, Ernie. Don't worry, real quick. All right, do it. Thanks. Thanks. And then I'll, I'll uh, we will get you back when you're ready to come in. So go ahead, Charlie. Finish. Oh, I'm done. But I'm I'm a little questionable about across that local control is automatically better, not for black people. So you believe that the Jim Crow laws are corrected? No, they were affected by local government. And so you believe the federal government corrected them? Yes. Yeah, it's called the Civil Rights Act. It invalidated all of them. I, on paper, for the no. most part. I, no, I, I, as a matter of fact, there's, there's, there was penalties. You could affect the price. It was not only, yeah, there was a price. You get you get convicted of discrimination, you you could be you have to pay the the part of your funding. They even do, put a penalty you know how for discrimination. Brought in a monetary revenue. penalty. Um, I would say I would say, and I and I don't know the official Green Party answer here. Um, in regards to that. Um, and I know you've been a grain for a lot longer than I have been. Um, um, so local, local to me um, is definitely where decisions could be made at, where the local control can be made at. Um, you know, we do we we do have a lot of uh, uh, powers at the. Um, but in regards to um, what's the best, I think that's a case by case basis. And I think together as a country, um, we can, um, it's something that needs to be addressed on that level and, and the country believes that it needs to be addressed on that level. I think that's what the political process is for. And I think those decisions will be made accordingly. And if people don't like that, then they'll um, start a new political process to repeal that and institute something better. Um, like for example, the gun control law in 1968, the gun dealers, uh, if they're, if you sold more than four, you had to register as a gun dealer um, and they did not allow gun sales um, at gun shows uh, to be sold. 1986 comes around, those got repealed. So in, in 1986, you had to register as a uh, gun dealer if it was more than your principal income. And they allowed guns um, at gun shows. And so that is the political process. Um, if it comes around again um, to make those 1968 laws again and repeal the 1986 laws, um, I think you know that that is a political process. And the Constitution, as we all probably remember from our probably elementary school, it's a living and breathing document. This is and not just, it shouldn't be just one said and done. I have, I have, this is the answer and that's it. No, if something is working, you know, the people will be happy. 
something is not working, people are not going to be happy. And if the people are not going to be happy and there's not a lot of happy people, the political process will, will, will shift. And so even though you might have local stuff, you might have federal stuff, which one's better? I think the political process um, will resolve those answers. And our founding people who made that constitution as a living, breathing document um, actually would have been successful. Oh, well, I got a really crazy question for you, Anna. What, I, I know we'll get on to you, but I want to know what kind of crow you like. What kind of what? Crow you like. I'm eating crow? <laughs> There's a site out here that I've often used. It's called crowbusters.com. I'll get to it in a rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> they, got, they got recipes like crispy crow kebabs, crow creole, and crows are rather smart birds. I'll, uh, when we get to the rebuttals, I'll do a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of, of the science of crow eating. <laughs> Never mind. Bad joke. All right, let's get our libertarian wrecking crew back. Go ahead. I am involved in an organization called New Illinois. And I also started a Facebook page called Movement for Chicagoland Statehood. I believe uh, that, that, that jurisdictions, states, can continue to decentralize politically from each other. For example, there's a rural uh, versus uh, urban divide in Illinois. It may make sense that Chicago be its own thing and the rural part of the state do its own thing. Does the Green Party support decentralization uh, in, this, in this sort of manner? Um, can you, can you read, I'm sorry, but can you repeat the question? Cause I'm not sure in what. Okay. Minute. So, um, I am involved with an organization called new Illinois and movement for Chicagoland statehood. <laughs> Would the green party support kind of sort of these decentralization in a way that includes s jurisdictions further dividing themselves to be more representative of the people that, for example, the rural and urban divide in, in Illinois may maybe could be resolved if both if both Chicago land and uh, the rest of the state were separated or I'm decentralized not, is the word I like to use. Right, I'm not sure what their stance is on on. And I can give you a Chicago. good progressive argument for it if you want to hear it sometime. Obviously not now, but. Uh, yeah, if there, yeah, what do you, if you don't know what the Green Party does think about this, what, what would you personally think about it? All right. First of all, I'm going to use my lifeline here because Charles has been a Green in Chicago <laughs> for decades now. Have you heard of, have you heard of like our stance on, on Chicago becoming its own state? I don't recall. That, that's just his own notion. That's, that's not given any any widespread. Uh, no one except him is talking about it. Mm -hmm. How can I say? No, I've heard of I've heard of it before. I've heard of uh, it. There's a thing that cities. It said cities are the slaves of the states. Um, there was a movement a few years ago to adapt a more regional structure. That's why you have a regional transportation authority. Makes perfectly good sense. Um, also, demographically, you run into things like the Chicago metropolitan area. It actually extends from Milwaukee around the lake to Indiana. Now, what's the appropriate unit of government uh, for that? Um, granted, a lot of this is. Uh, by accident, um, we were discussing earlier the structure of local government. It's not the same on the east or the south or the west than it is in the Midwest. Um, 
you know, it depends. I, as I was trying to define it, I hate to say it depends, but um, I believe that, you know, if you want to go, you could go to a regional structure. The government of the United States is organized into uh, regions, 10 regions. Do you want that structure? Uh, what is the most appropriate? There's another thing the environmentalists talk about a bioregion, which makes absolutely perfect sense if you're talking about ecological issues, because they do not stop or start on a border. They do not recognize uh, lines drawn on a map. Um, some of the things I've heard, I'm sorry, I shouldn't pour water on it, but we're not becoming a parliamentary form of government. And it's not likely that any major metropolitan area is going to separate from the state in which it's situated. So I, I don't perceive that as being an issue at the moment. That, I don't know if that answers it, Anna. Yeah, to me, I think it would just rely on the power of the people. So. All right. I think right now would be a good time to go to rebuttals. If anybody has no objections, I'll uh, give you each about five minutes. Who's got let's rebuttals? Thank our speaker. Yeah, let's thank our speaker. Oh, thank you. You know, I like coming on, even if it's not a guest. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's pretty good. Let me get pen and paper out so I can get a rebuttal. Rebutters down here. And uh, I'll... So into you know, uh, we'll we'll take. But I'm going to do the first rebuttal real quick, and I'm going to not not take too long. I like to, prefer, I like to be the last. -ish. But uh, who's next? All right, Raj, you want to go after me? I'd want to go, Ellen. Ellen. Who else? Charlie. I know you probably want one. Okay, and Bob, did you want a rebut? Ernie, okay, Ernie. I might, I might think of something after a little while. I don't have anything right now. Maybe something will come up. I'll rebut, uh, Tim. All right, which one? Uh, Justin. Yeah, Justin. Hey. Okay, Justin. And Brian too. Me, me too. <laughs> All right. Okay, and then uh, so I got me, and then Raj, then Ellen, then Ernie, then Bob, then Justin, then Brian. Anybody else? Oh, Ellen. Yeah, you you're, you got you. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Margaret? Okay. And then we'll put Charlie at the end like he always wants to be. Okay, I don't know. I want to try to give you like five. I'll have to go to four minutes each because it's 828, but it'll take a little while. But I don't know if anybody will use their entire four minutes or not. Let me get a clock up on the other computer so we can get started here. Um, bear with me for a minute. Uh, it's going to take me a second to pull this up. I'm going to try to keep uh, everybody on time tonight so we can get as many rebuttals as we can. All right. Um, I'm actually going to forego mine. So, Raj, you're next. Okay, Raj, go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh I came to understand what Green Party is doing nowadays in terms of substance. Maybe I was wrong. I, I didn't understand the topic or the headline. But uh, I will not vote for Republican Party or Green Party or the Libertarian Party because I didn't see anything here for Green Party. Uh, it, I see lots of chaos no no platform or if there is a need is everything variable it looks like everybody on their own or whatever they want so it didn't excite me and didn't, didn't give me guidelines or encouragement anything uh, the one of the most important thing green party can do is uh, their vast following young people they can train people going to house to house or whatever, how 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 to carry up toilet paper, how to say one of paper papers, how to how to have a better better way to 
green everything. And I don't, I don't see it, and I, do, I don't think they're going to do that because their, their political agenda is uh, so complicated and they want to do everything. I don't think they can do it. The, in my own way, I feel that a fusion energy is the main thing and it's going to get rid of all other energy in course of time. Probably in 100 years, there will not be nukes or uh, any, anything else, or coal or anything. The further I, as, as I hear you guys, and I study uh, the, all the green things, and all the, all the power thing and everything, and uh, you'll be surprised, it's not happening here. Whatever, whatever future is happening, it's not happening with the people and all these groups like this. Where is happening in technology? People are working hard to improve technology. They're working very hard to modeling the thing. And that's where everything is going to happen. Because, because I, every day, every, every night, I didn't see all four articles from technology. And, and it's very smart people, very hardworking people, very focused people. They are work, working all kinds of things, and that makes our life better. Not, nothing. Demo, dem, democracy itself like this, but we can see that in a small democracy, it's not working. Big democracy is not working. In a Congress itself, I do not see their congressmen or senators having much voice except that they can do hair and tinkering. Because the president has a, such a resource center and, and so much power that nothing else has one. So for Green Party or this part or, or a libertarian to aim that something going to happen, I don't it's not going to happen. And, and you will never understand, you will understand problem solving, which happens at a higher modeling level and internationally what is happening. There are other countries, China, India, in, in the Soviet Union, even Australia and the Middle East, things is happening. And the future is very complicated than you guys think. Individual doesn't matter so much. People are not interested. People are interested in good life. They're interested, they are not finding love. They are not finding somebody care for you. And those are the main issues. People are frustrated. Their life is screwed. They, 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 they do not find a self and refuge. You know, and religion has, has become a really bad thing. Religion is not teaching people to love. Religion not teaching people to care for each other. They're talking about their own promotion. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Raj. Um, now, uh, Ellen, you're next. I'll give you again about uh, four minutes. So go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, you know, I know your heart's in the right place, and I appreciate your your work and your idealism and commitment. Uh, I'm, you know, at the ripe old age of 66, and as a, I say, I've got 66 years of market research experience, and that I was born trying to figure out what's going on here, and noticed there was a tyranny. <laughs> I had a brother, older brother and sister. He was the captain, she was lieutenant, and I was the crew, and I had to lick the floor. And so that's kind of, you know, Lord of the Flies worldview I have. But uh, I do see us in a neo-feudalistic situation that, um, you know, we got really fascism is a political monopoly. And people say, oh, we got two parties, but they're really the same, you know, and they are being controlled by the CIA type, you know, hidden intelligence services. I was encouraged today that uh, someone, they actually mentioned on the radio, uh, on NPR, that somebody somewhere asked a question about whether the CIA is spying on us illegally. And uh, NPR and, you know, true propaganda CIA form said, uh, CIA says they're not doing anything illegal because they made it legal with the Patriot Act to spy on us and, and disappear the truth of the progressive left, uh, you know, wage a war on the progressive left, the anti-war movement. Uh, that's why they had to kill Martin Luther King. He was bringing the civil rights together with the anti-war movement. Um, you know, they, they proceed to disappear what they call you know, it's the anti-communism, the CIA, that's fascism, is basically a dirty, illegal police war 
on on what they call the left, you know, the communist, even though they manufactured Stalin and the left and they the extremist left, the extremist right. And what they do is have us warring on each other. Um, it's the strategy of tension that they, you know, fund all these wars and make a lot of money, arms sales, drug sales, uh, you know, the drug war, you get everybody stoned and drunk like MK Uctra. Um, they can, they'll put, put, frame you, put you in jail and make money for mass incarceration. And so these are the, the problem with, and it's interesting listening to Justin and versus you with your idea of localized decentralized government, because uh, I mean, federalism basically is how the Illuminati infiltrated the United States in 1776 to undermine us. This is federalism, you know, break it up, get the 50 states warring against each other, the 50 companies, the 50 parties, whatever, you know, the 50 countries, get everybody warring against each other, sovereign, who's sovereign, nobody's sovereign, you're sovereign, no, I'm sovereign, I win the, you know, battle of the brands, and it, you know, it's, it's really kind of sad, because it's like consumers don't have rights, I, what makes sense to me as an analyst, that's where I've gotten paid, a market research analyst, an economist, is that it, there's a supply and demand, and at this stage, in the fascist economy, political system, you know, political economy, geopolitical, they don't care what our demand is. And so, and actually David Icke had a great, a great insight on one of his comments. He's not, he's deplatformed. So you would never heard of him or maybe just heard that he liked lizards or something, but he's actually defines this as Hegelian situation, you know, problem. They create a problem, like Rahm Emanuel says, you know, a, a catastrophe, and they come up with this. Everybody reacts, ah, oh, terrorism. We, you know, the Islamic, you know, ISIS is coming to get them, which we created. And, or, you know, the virus is going to kill everybody, which we created. You know, the, you know, terrorism, you know, okay. And then war on terror. It, it's been very profitable. Democrat and Republican, you know, we can trace money with the stolen insula promise system which i've pushed out there and palantir they they're just playing around with the surveillance you know they even though voice of america and alan dulles said they weren't supposed to be spying and then just disappearing all the publishing of the left i'm going to send out this look at prevailing winds magazine 1999 identified all these issues michael parenti you know peter dale scott and, and yet it's they're disappeared. They're all in California, Berkeley. This these are the public intellectuals, and this is what we need. But it just is it's not gonna work politically, and it's depressing because God knows I, I am anti-fascist as they get, but yet right now I, the anti-fascists are in the internet and they can play these echo chamber games, knock me, you know, I'm I'm about they about beat me. I'm just like you know, I, there is a lot of danger in the vaccine and the virus, which we created. But if nobody ever believes me, it's not an issue I can run on, though it's the issue the Republicans can win on. You know, um, I mean, it's it's a wonderful disinformation universe. And I, but uh, I just wish the, the Green Party should do market research. All you need is 300 people. Look at what the problems are. Look at why people vote and speak to that. And we won't have a red wave if, they, if we could just get Biden or any left-wing person to admit that these vaccines are killing us. Otherwise, it's going to be the issue. I know I'm moving to Georgia because I have to. I can't go to any restaurants. I can't go into any clubs. I can't do anything. And it's not going away. You know, oh, that's just your opinion. Okay, it's a hard one to prove, but uh, it is a real, real big what is it mega trend and it's going to destroy the fucking left though we, we've already been destroyed it's too late and when i say look at that don't look up it's not because of slow little environmental change it's the virus that's killing us and yet you know nobody believes me but that look at that movie and just think how has I it been five minutes like that uh, okay yeah, that, that, justin shut the fuck up what in your life okay minutes, but, an uh, all right let's wrap it up next person please Ernie, go ahead. Ernie, are you there? I guess he isn't ready yet. We'll go back to him. Bob, are you ready? 
Bob. Okay, Justin, go ahead. Justin, you're next. All right, all right. It's my turn already? Okay. Yeah. All right, so I, I apologize for burping earlier. If you heard that. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else did. Okay, I, I was kind of embarrassed about it. And I was like, uh, I'm sitting here with Brian, so I forgot I was like not on mute. So I also apologize for moderating. Sorry, Tim, I didn't mean that's, to step that's in. That's all right. I mean, I, 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 I didn't mean to. So I asked God for forgiveness. And I ask forgiveness from the college for moderating. Okay. All right. All right. Well, so uh, I wanted to rebut Ernie earlier. Uh, Ernie said, what, has the, what, what are the accomplishments of third parties? We had uh, Justin Amash became the first <laughs> member of Congress to be a to the first libertarian member of Congress. And he introduced changes to the Constitution. He introduced several laws, including ballot acts, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, <clears throat> police reform, uh, qualified immunity. Um, so, you know, I do think that there's like a percolation, you know, things are rising, you know, I think that that's, there is something there. And I think that having a, you know, a co sitting congressman join a third party uh, as a member of Congress is a very big accomplishment for for third party to have. So um, I think that Ernie should consider that. Um, and I, you know, ballot access is another thing, as Anna mentioned, that hinders uh, third parties. And Thank you, Brian Dennehy, for putting your neck on the line and helping the Libertarian Party be established in Cook County. Uh, we took advantage of, of, a, of you know, <laughs> it, 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 Wayne Gretzky, whatever that quote is about, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't make. Like, you know, you got to, you got to, you know, third parties do have to kind of take every opportunity they have and it's hard and it's hard to whip up support and get people to, to petition and sign petitions. And it's not for everybody to, to run and to do that sort of stuff. So third parties have a disadvantage for sure. So I, I think that the green party libertarians DSA should all work together. Like I mentioned uh, about the, oh. the drug war statement and also to buy stock in Exelon. I so we can crash say, their shareholder meeting. <laughs> uh, Tim, Seems hit mute. Um, and then we can push, for, we can crash their shareholder meeting and we can okay. we'll see try to time set, time. you know, push through an agenda as shareholders of Exelon. I mean, you know, if we can all buy a share or two and you get a bunch of us to do it, that could make a difference. Thank you, Tim, for uploading uh a lot of the 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 videos i hope you're going to upload more soon i really want to see will. brian's i want to see my new illinois one and my two libertarian ones if you want to prioritize that we're gonna go I can, back i can make it interesting for you wink wink i know we'll uh know. ellen corley i like your hair it looks great uh it looks good i'm i'm glad you're doing okay it's good to see you and i'm sorry uh about interrupting your rebuttal. Um, I want to implore Charlie to quit smoking. Uh, he's at risk. He's that, you know, I want him to be less likely to catch COVID. So I employ Charlie to make healthy decisions and quit smoking, please, Charlie, because you also got a condition as well. And, and I also want to save the taxpayers as much money as they can on the healthcare plan that you are going to inevitably you you know uh, take advantage of as as somebody who uh, is a smoker who you know yeah. uh, another I want to I want to address a straw uh, a straw man Charlie said earlier he mentioned that libertarians say local control is the best okay none of us said that tonight. Even Anna never said that. Uh, so another one of those Charlie, the tanky straw man uh, uh, arguments he has. 
I want to I want to recommend Anna read a book. It's a very small book. You can listen on audio in maybe a couple hours. It's called The Law by a philosopher named Frederick Bastia. <laughs> and it's it's a very good, uh, you know, I, as somebody who believes in local control and grassroots democracy, I think you might find it to be a very interesting read. The English translation uh, includes uh, like little chapter headings that aren't in the original French, uh, but it's it, uh, read it, listen to it. Uh, the law, Frederick Bastiat. Okay. Um, Let's wrap it up, okay? When you're ready. And I like your glasses, Anna. They look cool. Oh. All right. Brian, Thank you were going to do a rebuttal next. Brian, you were signed up. Are you going to do one? So the... Um, um, the, the rights of the individual, I, I, I think sometimes, how do I reconcile my personal ethics with my political positions? And do no harm, do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, judge not, lest ye be judged. I understand, I mean, I, like, I was raised in the Christian faith, and that's the ethical framework with which I view the world. Um, I, I'm not a Christian, but <clears throat> that's the background. So libertarian philosophy comp conforms with my ethics that I don't, <clears throat> where, where would I as a person want to use force against another person to, to compel them to do what I want them to do, what I think they should do. And I, <laughs> as a person, shit, <laughs> nope. I ain't trying to tell you how to live your life. I ain't trying to tell you what to do. I ain't trying to take nothing from you. And <clears throat> so, and, and, and I don't expect anyone to try to do that stuff to me. Why would politics be different? You know, how does politics, you know, separate itself from personal ethics in, in a way like that? I didn't grant politicians authority that I as a person don't have myself. How, how could they, how could they possess an authority that, how could I delegate authority to them that I don't personally possess? And, and just because they get together in a big group and decide that this is what's best for everyone and therefore this is what we're gonna to do to you. Like, I, I didn't give them the authority to decide that. Like, you know, just because I, I voted for them and supported their candidacy doesn't mean I, I consent to every stupid idea they come up with in every, uh, in every way and means to use force to take stuff from people and throw them in cages and threaten them. So, you know, like I, I, when someone, you know, like, you know, my pink old friend, Charlie wants to use the government to solve every stupid problem in the world. And I just think, you know, like, come on, Stalin, you know, give it a rest, huh? You know, sometimes these guys, they, they ain't acting in everybody's best, best interest. Sometimes they just do stupid things and they got tanks. So, all right. Thanks a lot. All right, Ernie, you had one you wanted to go back and rebut with. Go ahead, Ernie. Okay, Ernie, unmute. Can you unmute him, Tim? I can unmute him. You're going to have to unmute, Ernie. Okay, right on the uh, lower. Lower left, hit your microphone. You did it before once, Ernie. Sorry about that. Okay, right on the lower left. No. Okay, Ernie, we can't hear you still. Ernie, Ernie, we can't, we can't hear you. You did, you need to unmute. 
We, Ernie, we need you to unmute, Ernie. We can't hear you. Tim, I'm sorry. Are you sure you can't mute? Unmute? No, you I can mute, mute but uh, you can't I can't unmute. Oh. Ernie, you need to just uh, hit your microphone at the lower left where it says unmute. There we go. It was not yeah. unmuting. I was clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking, and it wasn't unmuting. So okay. I'm sorry. That's sometimes, sometimes that happens with Zoom with uh, latency sometimes. I apologize. All right. But All right. Not, not your fault. But if that ever happens again, Go put that little thing up because when you put the little thing up where it says the the uh, moderator wants you to unmute, it works. So okay. anyway, yeah, thank you. Um, I find myself, though uh, historically, I haven't agreed with Brian on in in some occasions, but uh, uh, in many cases I do. I agree with many of the things that the Green Party and the uh, Libertarians and some of the other third parties have to say. But it, it's a very difficult situation. David Ramsey Steele, who many of you have heard, explained it to, to for the first time to my satisfaction is why we have a two-party system in this country and not a multi-party system. And in most countries where the vote for the, for the chief executive of the country is a direct vote, and it is here essentially, we've got the College of Complexes, but our College of the Electoral College, which is in between, but it is really uh, a direct vote of the citizens for the person, as opposed to uh, electing people who then elect a prime minister. And he pointed out that it almost always in cases like that goes to a two party system because people will, will view their votes as not being meaningful. Now I agree with Anna that any, any uh, ser sincerely cast vote counts is important, but nonetheless, it doesn't necessarily uh, elect uh, people to office. And uh, so I, I would favor uh, a couple of things. First of all, getting money totally out of politics, essentially making it uh, forbidding any spending of money on, on most uh, promotions and campaign advertising and things like that. Uh, get money out of politics offer uh, several uh, forums and town halls on public TV or other TV for the candidates and maybe even some uh, newspaper write-ups and so forth, but no, but no spending of money because obviously what happens is the, uh, the offices are bought ultimately uh, one way or the other. So getting money out of politics would be a good thing. A parliamentary system would be a good thing, but that would be even harder uh, to implement. If somehow we got uh, geography out of it and didn't divide the country into districts, which gives us all kinds of problems, it gives us gerrymandering among other things, uh, but rather uh, voted, voted candidates at large. So if you wanted a labor candidate, you vote for labor, you want a business candidate, you, uh, you, you want an environmental candidate, whatever, you vote for people based on their positions. Uh, again, hard to implement, but would give us uh, uh, really, I think, uh, a, a fair system or a system that more accurately reflects the collective views of the country. And, uh, but it also bothers me the fact that even with our two-party system, uh, one party can win by a very slim majority of the votes and have total control of the government in, in some cases. Uh, usually not for the whole country, but sometimes in some ways we do, uh, but for certain uh, jurisdictions. And so the, the people who had 49% of the votes or even 45 get no say whatsoever. And the people with the slight majority have a big say. I don't know. I don't know that there's a way to deal with that very easily, but that's a problem that our system has and has always had because many, many of our elections in recent years have been very close which indicates that a lot of people uh, ended up with a, with, a, with a government that they didn't like. And uh, I, I, somehow or another, that doesn't seem to me to be a healthy situation. So I'll stop there and move on to who's ever next. Okay, we got, uh, we got Bob, we got Margaret, and we got Charlie. Uh, Bob, are you wanting to say anything or rebut? If not, I can go to uh, 
Margaret. Okay, sorry, I couldn't find, I had my screen minimized and I, I couldn't find a button to, to, to make it go back. So I, so I could take off my mute last time. But anyway, now I've since found it. Okay, so um, I, I found a, an older web page um, that, was, that had quite a bit of data about uh, stunning Green Party demographics. And, uh, and, a, and a lot of this, this page is also a lot, a lot about uh, third party parties in general. <clears throat> but now again, uh, this is and this page was created in, in 2016 so it's got a few years behind it but at that time 60 <clears throat> percent of the green party was was made up of women and and i believe it was uh let's see um people in the 18 to 24 age demographic or are two times more likely to support the Green Party than the next closest age demographic. Thought that was kind of interesting. And they're four times more likely to support the Green Party compared to the 55 plus age demographic, which, which was also quite interesting, I think. 64% um, of the Green Party voters believe that the government should do more to reduce income inequality. So that's a that's a big problem that probably shows the uh, the youth of the party that they don't have an understanding of of economics, and so that's uh, really a, just a you know kind of a, it's our fault for uh, letting our schools go go so far to hell that people would believe that kind of stuff. Um, Forty two percent of the Green Party voters believe that the economy and the environment are the top issues. That must be addressed. Um, I don't know what we can really read out of that, other than <coughs> than uh, the, than fifty eight percent then must think that there are other top issues that should be addressed. Um, more than seventy percent of the Green Party demographics do not trust the government. <laughs> well, that, that I can agree with, and are dissatisfied with how democracy is being approached. Well. I'll cut that all those demographic things off there and just say that what we have to, I think, realize we've got to open our eyes. We've got to smell the coffee and realize that our government's been taken over by Marxists. <laughs> right now, the most serious thing we need to do is to take our government back from the Marxists. <coughs> and so the, <laughs> so the, the Greens, totally the Libertarians, you need to come back home. You need to think about, you know, what this what this loss of our freedom of speech means. Uh, look at this thing with uh, with uh, Biden and this uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, nomination, where he comes out and says that it's going to be a black female. Right off the bat, he just eliminated ninety four percent of the population will not even be considered. Because of somebody, you know, because he's going to choose somebody of a particular race. What could be more racist than that? <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're we're paying we're paying four dollars a gallon for gas. It's probably going to get worse. Inflation's been the highest it's been in at least forty years, maybe more. Um, you know, <clears throat> we're supposed to follow the people. Uh, we're supposed to follow the science. That, the people that are telling us to wear masks and everything, same people that are trying to tell us that, you know, men, there's no difference between men and women. Um, so, so it's totally, uh, totally wacko. <clears throat> so I would hope that, uh, that the, 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 you know, more intelligent members of the Green Party and the Libertarian Party would realize that the more important thing right now is to get rid of the Marxists that are running the country, you know, <coughs> vote uh, Republican in 2022 and be part of the of the red tidal wave. Okay, Bob. Thanks a lot. Uh, Margaret, you're next, so please go ahead. I mean, thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, I would say Bob rendered me speechless, but that's not usually true to begin with. 
Um, I don't remember who said this, but I think it was Mark Twain or somebody, but Americans do the right thing. At, oh no, it was Winston Churchill. Americans finally do the right thing after they've tried everything else and failed. So that's, <laughs> that's part of what's going on here. Uh, second of all, there is a role for local politics as well as federal politics, as well as state politics. Um, I think federal politics were incredibly, or federal action was incredibly, was critical in the case of civil rights because the, um, the, the Ku Klux Klan, for example, was after, after the turn of the last century, really became part of law enforcement agencies, became part of local politics in Colorado, where I'm from, that you don't think about as part of the South. They almost elected a Ku, an open Ku Klux Klan member as state governor in 1930. I think he missed by like 200 votes. So the whole focus of that is the white Christian supremacist stuff, the white nationalist stuff. And that's been the focus of the groups that tried to do a coup d'etat in Washington in January 6th. They were the ones that wanted to put Trump in power, back in power, and uh, established established really a white Christian um, nationalism and, and undoubtedly a fascist government. So you need federal things to do that. And federal action was needed in 1965 to counteract Jim Crow. And in fact, because the restrictions of Jim Crow were so profound and so widespread. The Civil Rights Act did have significant, significant uh, ramifications. For example, 1965 was the first time that most black women were able to vote. And that's a whole block now in Georgia. And that's who is uh, opposing these white fascist people in Georgia. Um, so, uh, okay, so, you know, you know, just because you don't understand how pervasive racism was in the 60s and before that, doesn't mean that federal action didn't have long-term permanent and far-reaching consequences. Okay, so then the other thing that I wanted to say is I actually voted for Green Party candidates for the mm -hmm. Metropolitan Water District because I looked and they were the most qualified. They had the, the skills that they needed to do data analysis to make sure that stuff is working right, that the, that the Democratic candidates didn't have, that the Republican candidates didn't have. So, okay, uh, what else? So I, I, I really agree that, that we need to abolish Citizens United. That was just devastating, that whole thing to put so much money into politics and not know where it was coming from and not being able to trace back who it was coming from, just that it was there and it was influencing, it was had an enormous influence on what was going on. So, um, and to take money out of politics essentially and to make it all, all, only the campaigns, campaign finance reform so that the candidates could only use campaign finance money that was raised by taxes or by what people, by taxes, literally, so it was everybody. So that then what happened is they could actually focus their time on doing legitimate lawmaking rather than calling people on the phone and telling them to send money. So um, I think that th there was a system of proportional voting in, in Illinois years and years ago, and it was how Paul Simon got into office. And most of us talk about St. Paul, but anyway, um, who really did do a lot of very of progressive, <laughs> sorry about that, stuff that really benefited us all. 
And it was because they had proportional voting. And I don't know that much about it, but it had to do with you voted. And then the, there was a runoff. Then they also had to include the other people. And there were two representatives for each district two state representatives for each district. And so one of the ways they got it outlawed is they said, we're spending too much money um, supporting all these representatives. But what happened was that we lost a lot of, of, um, of representational representation of ideas that weren't as popular when we had this proportional voting in these two representatives and state representatives in the district. Now this was like 40 or 50 years ago. So, you know, who knows? Anyway, so um, that's my comment. Some people okay. uh, yeah, should Rob, yeah, play, play yeah. off the graphs before they start making comments. Anyway, okay. Okay. So I drink yeah, a, I drink a glass of wine. So All right. Any... Yeah, Rob, yeah, Rob, yeah. Okay, Charlie, you're next. <laughs> All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Anna for coming out and giving us a presentation and uh, assiduously uh, answering the various sundry questions put to her. I think this ballot initiative is an interesting idea. I hope they take place across the state. Uh, it is incumbent upon each of us to notify organizations that we may be aware of that might take advantage of this opportunity. I also would like to see initiatives regarding uh, the establishment of public transportation, as opposed to Tim, whose only concern appears to be roads to drive cars down, uh, their rural provision of transit where appropriate. Uh, the next thing is, we're talking a little bit about privatization. Um, there's under and in no circumstances should we embrace any public private partnership. Don't allow the, the capitalists to get their hands on our infrastructure. Take it away from them. Whatever infrastructure the private sector has, nationalize it uh, by any means necessary. Uh, these guys have been nothing but, and believe you me, that, that goes back to 2008 when government revenue was at a low and they were looking toward uh, affiliating with the private sector, it, it was a disastrous mistake in transportation areas. Uh, do not repeat that under any circumstances. Keep the private sector off our infrastructure. Uh, the other thing about nationalizing industries, uh, the Greens have something called the eco-socialism they have an eco-socialist network, and they look towards implementation of a solidarity economy, an economy that works for all the people. Um, last of all, and, and next, uh, regarding um, nationalization of industries, uh, you have to keep in mind, or the level of government, rather, uh, is that there's something, the economy has grown uh, consolidated into uh, the multinational corporations are operating. Now the little farmer doesn't have a chance uh, against the, the agri business. The only hope he's got is that the government takes his side on issues so that he can remain in operation. Otherwise he has no chance. These multinational corporations and control, and control entire countries around the world. So keep that in mind. If you want to be, let them control the world. And if you want to give everything you own and work for, for a multinational corporation run by a bunch of CEOs who could care less about you. The government nationwide uh, is the one force that is capable of counteracting what they are up to these days. And lastly, about candidates, this thing about getting money out of politics, la -de -la -de -la, and, and ballot signatures. I'll tell you one thing though, you say get money out of politics. One thing about running for office is, I can't, one of the first tests 
is to put together a viable campaign. Now, if that involves collecting money in this fashion or that, what have you? But we know democracy is not benefited by having lunatics who are capable of even the basic administrative tasks, thinking that they should run for office. It is some sort of test, must be some sort of test, must be imposed to determine who we are voting for at the initial level, whether that be fundraising or getting signatures or getting people. I was looking at another candidate and he already assembled a team of volunteers to collect signatures. Has it been five minutes yet? It's been four. It's been close to it. He's still, he's still running the goddamn pro college. I thought you. All right. He said he wasn't going to do it. Uh, like, All right. Thank you again, uh, Anna. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm running the college. Thank you. It's always a pleasure coming on. All right, Anna, it's your turn to uh, give final remarks. So go ahead. All right. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming. It's always nice to see everybody. Um, and so again, I put in, in chat with the township ballot question. Um, so that is uh, up to the township, uh, up to um, people to decide if and what question they will bring to their township. You will need at least 15 registered voters um, to sign a, the petition. There's sample petitions on there. There's sample letters on there. Um, max, you, you can do a maximum of 30. Bring that to your township clerk no later than March 1st. Um, once you get that on, uh, once you bring that to your township, um, obtain a timestamp receipt. Uh, follow up with your township, make sure it's on the agenda. If your township gives you any problem, um, you can refer them to Berwyn Township. You can refer to them to Peoria. Uh, you can refer them to Naperville Township. These are the townships that have had um, the, the ballot question um, on their agenda before. So they are familiar with this process. Um, so you bring it to your township no later than March 1st, get the timestamp receipts. Um, and then you start making sure that you can get your people out there for the second Tuesday of in April, which is April 12th. Um, this is only for um, the jurisdictions outside of the city of Chicago proper and city of Chicago does not have townships, they have wards. Um, and so what the Illinois Green Party is planning on doing is having the petition being presented to the city council, the Chicago city council 10 a.m. on April 13th. Um, and the, and the, the question that is being uh, presented to the Chicago city council is for uh, the Chicago city of Chicago um, and their agencies to make a priority date of January 1st, 2030 for zero carbon emissions um, and to address climate action now. Um, so there are sample um, questions on the website on ilgp.org slash April 2022. Um, in, more than free to have those uh, sample questions brought in, make your own, revise them. Um, we do believe in the grassroots democracy um, and uh, decentralization. So th these are two of our key values that we have. Um, you can also visit ilgp.org for more information. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for their comments. You know, this is again, so good for our unique perspectives, unique experiences. Not everybody is the same. We don't do one size fits all policy um, in regards to um, uh, uh, in regards to that's the answer. We like to come together and uh, collab, uh, be collaborative on on these items, and um, make sure that we can march forward with a good government and get rid of this uh, us versus them attitude because that is not, um, I think we've all agreed that is not working um, and that that is not the government that we see. Um, I hope that we can all be leaders and that we can march forward together 
and have clean water and clean air and um, and uh, have have a good government. Okay, and I think Ernie's got one more question for you, real quick. Go ahead, Ernie. Go ahead. Uh, am I? Can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Yeah, I yes. just wanted to. Uh, something I forgot to say. You know, following in Justin's lead, maybe you said that you started in politics in two thousand in the year two thousand, approximately. Correct. You must have been in kindergarten or something. <laughs> I was in college, um, and actually, I was uh, uh, became president of the Social and Justice Peace Group, and we led a um, thousand students uh, walk out at the Northern Illinois University um, when um, Bush uh, declared Iraq War. So, oh. and there was only a core of six, and we had a thousand come out, um, oh. including our Republican uh, uh, people, and um, I heard they. I heard they that the state legislators told the Republican party part, party of of our uh, student group to come on out. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was the beginning of my political career. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you. And um, I'm sorry. What was it? Tom? I, yeah, Tom. Tom in the back, who a, was a Green Party candidate a few years ago tom i'm Durkin. gonna i might have to look them up i had no he idea. ran against heather stains wow that's great okay wow. so anyway well good work thank, thank you very you. much Oops. thank you okay I hope thank you, you justin it. for helping run the meeting <laughs> 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 I know you guys love it. Some it. That's why I do it. You know. <laughs> What'd you say? I said Tim might be able to take some time off. <laughs> oh, no. Tim's just chilling, smoking. You know, I'm just letting. You know, he didn't stop me from doing it, so oh, he implicitly no. lets me do it. Tim, are we adjourned? I think we're gonna be officially adjourned now, but we'll keep the Zoom call open. With this, the College of Complexes oh, is officially adjourned.